Good afternoon, everyone. The first item of business is a debate on motion 5515 in the name of Mark MacDonald on keeping children safe online. I call on Mark MacDonald to speak to and move the motion around 14 minutes, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government, I'm pleased to open this debate on child internet safety and to move the motion in my name. Uh, on the 21st of April this year, I launched the National Action Plan on Internet Safety for Children and Young People, which sets out 23 actions for the Scottish Government and partners to improve internet safety for children and young people. In developing this action plan, we've worked across government with third sector organisations, uh, Education Scotland, Police Scotland, and importantly, with children and young people themselves. The action plan has two overarching aims. Firstly, that children and young people are able to enjoy the internet, show resilience and take advantage of the many opportunities it has to offer. Therefore, a key priority includes equipping children and young people themselves to stay safe online. Secondly, that children and young people are protected, safe and supported in the digital world. Therefore, priorities include ensuring parents and carers feel empowered to support their child's online activity, supporting children and young people who have suffered abuse online and deterring potential perpetrators from committing online abuse in the first place. It also emphasises the role that wider society, including the online industry, must play in enhancing internet safety for children and young people. I'd like to highlight some of the actions from the plan in the Chamber this afternoon. Before I do, however, it's important to highlight that the internet and mobile technologies have positively transformed the lives of children and young people, bringing vast opportunities for learning, empowerment, communication and support. We must ensure that we equip, they equip our children and young people to benefit from those opportunities and to do so safely. The amount of time children and young people spend online has more than doubled since 2005, and they spend more time online than they do watching TV, using apps such as Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, YouTube and WhatsApp, to name only a few. And the ways in which young people are, are online continues to develop, with new apps and developments in gaming allowing greater interaction online than ever before. Now, I recognise that for many children and young people, there is less and less distinction between the online and offline worlds. Many young people no longer understand the concept of going online in the way many of us in the chamber do. Their lives and identities are inextricably linked to their ability to interact and exist across the internet. However, increasing reliance on online technologies makes us all, and especially children and young people, potentially vulnerable to those who seek to exploit these technological advancements for malicious, fraudulent or criminal purposes. Being aware of the risks associated with this changing behaviour is so important to ensure that our children and young people can feel confident when going online and that we feel empowered to support them effectively. Unfortunately, we are all aware that the internet is increasingly being used as a cover and a vehicle for those who wish to harm and abuse children. To under understand the scale of the issue, over a six-week period in summer 2016, 523 children were identified as victims or potential victims of online child sexual abuse or other related abuse during Police Scotland's Operation Latisse, the first national operation of focused activity to tackle the many forms of online child sexual abuse. Extrapolation of those figures means over 4,500 children a year are being harmed or potentially harmed online, with potentially many more. Now, online child sexual abuse is a national threat, and the reality is that it is happening now to children of all ages. As part of the action plan, we will work to ensure professionals and communities have the appropriate skills and knowledge to provide support to children and young people, including those who have suffered abuse online. We will work with the Marie Collins Foundation, a UK charity, to pilot the Click Path to Protection training module in Scotland, which is targeted at all professionals charged with safeguarding children who have been sexually abused and exploited online. And while this government is already committed to progressing child protection training for professionals working with children and young people, including teachers, I do take on board the need to ensure that this includes equipping teachers with skills and knowledge on online safety to teach digitally, as they will increasingly do so in the future, uh, with confidence. Uh, so I'm happy to accept the amendment in Tavish Scott's name in that spirit. Uh, but we should not single out any one group of professionals or one part of our population. Uh, we all must see the protection of children as our collective responsibility, and we all must work together to ensure children and young people are protected online. Importantly, the industry, and social media providers in particular, must also see the protection of children as a core responsibility. The NSPCC in O2 recently found that four out of five children feel that social media companies aren't doing enough to protect them from pornography, self-harm, bullying, 
and hatred on their sites. Children and young people surveyed overwhelmingly said social media providers need to do more to protect them from inappropriate or harmful content. This makes it clear that children and young people don't feel that they are protected from inappropriate and upsetting content online and that social media companies need to do more to protect them. Now, I do recognise the efforts of the online industry, including internet ser service providers and social media providers, to keep children safe online. Many have made efforts to provide support for parents, run campaigns to address key issues, and developed responses to the changing challenges faced by those using their platforms. I also acknowledge and welcome the engagement by industry with those in the third sector and with government. However, I strongly agree with children and young people that the online industry needs to do more. As part of the action plan, we've committed to working with digital media providers and industry to ensure parents, carers and families, as well as children and young people, have access to appropriate information and support. This includes... I'll happily give way. I, um, I can allow extra time for interventions, so Mr Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you. Uh, can uh, the uh, Minister give us further information on how we might support parents in particular? I do note among the actions uh, that parents and carers are highlighted, but they will be one of the most difficult groups to educate and to reach. And, of course, I think we will all recognise that children are probably, in many senses, more expert than the adults in the uh, uh, environment in which we're talking about. Mark MacDonald. Yeah. Well, I thank Mr Stevenson for his intervention. He has somewhat preempted what I'm about to come on and speak about a little bit later. Um, but so I can respond to him directly just now. I absolutely agree and recognise the uh, situations that he describes. Um, I myself as a parent find it very difficult sometimes to relate to the uh, online activity that my own daughter uh, undertakes through her tablet device. And, um, you know, I wouldn't class myself as being all that old, although others may disagree. Um, but at the same time, I do recognise that the internet and the way in which the internet is being used has moved on substantially uh, over a, a very short space of time and we have to ensure that all of society is able to cope with that pace of change and ensure that we protect children as part of that. So our ongoing engagement will include UK-wide discussions with social media companies, technology firms, young people, charities and mental health experts focusing on industry responsibilities to society, how technology can improve safety uh, and helping parents face up to and discuss dangers and how to help young people help themselves. As we developed this action plan, uh, we spoke to children and young people and they told us that one of their main concerns online is bullying. Now, bullying of any kind is totally unacceptable and we should intervene early, deal with it quickly, whenever and wherever it happens. Importantly, it's clear that online bullying shouldn't be treated any differently to offline bullying. This is what young people have told us themselves. Online bullying, or cyberbullying as it is often referred to, is the same behaviour as offline uh, and it certainly doesn't feel any different to being bullied online or offline for those who experience it. The Scottish Government continues to fully fund Respect Me, the National Anti-Bullying Service, which provides direct support to local authorities, schools, youth groups and all those working with children and young people. We expect that all schools develop and implement an anti-bullying policy which should be reviewed and updated on a regular basis. And these policies should reflect the overarching local authority policy and our refreshed anti-bullying guidance. The National Approach to Anti-Bullying for Scotland, Children and Young People will be published later this year. So we want all children and young people to learn tolerance, respect, equality and good citizenship to address and prevent prejudice, as well as about healthy relationships, which are all attributable to both online and offline environments. Now, education is one of the most important areas where we can work to promote internet safety for children and young people, and we are committed to making sure child internet safety is properly recognised in Scottish education. Children and young people will learn about the safe and responsible use of different technologies, including the internet and social media, as part of their broad general education under Curriculum for Excellence. As part of the action plan, we've committed to working well, just one second. As part of the action plan, we've committed to working with the South West Grid for Learning to promote and update the 360 degree safe tool, which is used by schools in Scotland to help ensure that schools continue to have robust, up to date e safety policies in place. Daniel Johnson. Microphone. Excuse me, Mr. Johnson, your microphone's. Ah, that, bye bye. Obviously, not very good at technology. <laughs> Still making rookie mistakes when you're in. Um, <laughs> Daniel I, I Johnson. I welcome the comments about incorporating those elements into the broad general education. 
Um, I was just wondering if the Minister could maybe just uh, elaborate on some of the details that will be uh, undertaken to train existing teachers who are already practising. Mark Macdonald. Well, I think, I think Mr Johnson makes a fair point, and the government is committed to ensuring that we review uh, not just the uh, initial teacher education, which of course uh, the government made a commitment to do, but also look at the continuous professional development that is made available to teachers and how we can make that more relevant. Um, we have a number of uh, programmes which are underway looking at how we can uh, basically empower both pupils and teachers uh, in these regards um, and I'm more than happy to uh, write to Mr Johnson with more detail of the specific programmes that are in place but also uh, keep that matter under review in relation to those. So while I said that education is one of the most important areas where we can work to promote internet safety for children and young people, um, I believe, as I highlighted to Mr Stevenson, that empowering parents and carers to guide and support their child's online activity is most definitely another. Uh, smartphone and tablet ownership among children and young people is on the increase. Uh, this means that they are accessing the internet everywhere they go, including their home. Uh, Ofcom recently reported that more than half of three to four year olds and 75% of five to 15 year olds use a tablet in their home. And this is in addition to smartphone ownership, having access to a smart TV, games console, desktop computer or laptop. So it is therefore more important than ever for parents and carers to feel confident to engage in this activity. In addition to the anti-bullying service, Respect Me delivers parent training sessions on internet safety across Scotland, providing practical advice to parents and carers on online settings and security. Indeed, there are a wide range of resources and opportunities out there for parents and carers provided by industry, third sector organisations and Police Scotland. But not all parents and carers are aware of these resources or know which ones to use. So I've committed to engaging with parents and carer organisations across Scotland to host a series of events aimed at empowering parents and carers to support their children's online activity. That also includes enabling parents and carers to feel confident about having open conversations with their children, to encourage them to communicate responsibly with their children and to know where to go for help if they need it, promoting the vast array of existing resources that I've outlined are out there. We also need to equip children and young people themselves to stay safe online. We need to ensure all children and young people are fully armed with the knowledge of their rights and skills they need to use the internet safely. This includes an understanding of cyber risks and threats in a time we are experiencing cyber crime at an unprecedented rate. Children and young people told us that the most important thing to improve online safety was for them to be supported to build their own personal resilience. Therefore, we will work with our partners to ensure children and young people are supported to build their own resilience online. Young people also told us that talking about staying safe online through peer networks is one of the most effective ways to reach them. And we continue to support Police Scotland's Choices for Life Be Smart peer mentoring programme and fund the Mentors in Violence Prevention programme, both of which encourage young people to think carefully about the way they behave online and ensure that they remain safe and supported. As we work to improve internet safety for children and young people, listening to their voices is vital. The Scottish Government is proud to support the Five Rights campaign and have awarded £100,000 of funding to Young Scott to help place young people at the heart of the Five Rights Coalition in Scotland and support them to develop insights and make recommendations about rights in the digital world. The five, if, if I have time, Presiding Officer? Yeah, happy to. Jamie Green. Uh, give me some time to do that. On the Five Rights uh, uh, Coalition, um, one of the five rights is the right to remove. Uh, and I just wondered what analysis the Scottish Government's uh, done around what specific legislative powers this Parliament has, or indeed perhaps the UK Government has, around uh, enforcement of that, because I think that's one of the key points, is that uh, when content is out there in the public domain and is shared and multiplied in numerous times, it's very difficult to, to, trace, to, to, to trace that and to get to the people uh, that, that own that content. How do, we get, how, do people, how do young people know where to go to get that content off once it's in the public domain? I think that's a really uh, big area to look at. Mark McDonald. I, I thank Jamie Green for the intervention and he's quite right uh, in highlighting it and he will be aware that um, much of the legislation which underpins the issue he highlights uh, remains reserved to Westminster but we remain in constant dialogue uh, with our colleagues in the UK government in relation to how we can best uh, ensure that inappropriate content is removed from the internet uh, as soon as possible. And I had a very constructive discussion with the Internet Watch Foundation, uh, who are actively uh, working to remove inappropriate content. I believe they sent a briefing to members ahead of the debate today, and I would certainly encourage members uh, to enter into discussion with the Internet Watch Foundation and help to highlight their work 
uh, and how people can contact them uh, within their local communities uh, as well. So the Five Rights Coalition have identified a, a youth commission consisting of 19 people from across Scotland to develop informed insights, ideas, recommendations and solutions in relation to how Scotland can become a nation which realises and respects children and young people's digital rights. Uh, I look forward to their final report in the coming weeks uh, and we will carefully consider its findings in future policy development. So, Presiding Officer, as, a, as the Minister for Childcare in early years, but also as a, a father of two, I want all children and young people in Scotland to be protected, safe uh, and supported in the online world and for them to be able to enjoy the internet, show resilience uh, and take advantage of the opportunities it has to offer. Uh, that's not just the responsibility of industry, social media providers, parents, teachers or other professionals, it's the responsibility of all of us uh, as a society. It's everyone's job to do all we can to keep our children and young people safe, whether that be in our local communities or in the virtual world. And while there is no doubt that the digital world they inhabit now and in the future contains risks and challenges for their well-being, we should not lose sight of the fact that it is a fundamental part of the lives of children and young people today. It's a fantastic source of education and entertainment. It's the first place they often go to talk to their friends. And I also would encourage young people to embrace the internet's huge potential. Minister, I can't remember if you moved the motion, but would you do so to I, make sure? I, I did at the beginning, but you I formally did. move it now just to be safe. Okay, the motion is twice moved. I, I also forgot at the beginning of the debate to ask those who wish to contribute to press the request to speak button. So can I ask that you do that now? And I call Annie Wells to speak to and move amendment 5515.2. Uh, around nine minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. I would just like to start by moving the amendment in my name and just say that the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting the government and um, the amendment in the name of Tavish Scott today. Um, I welcome this debate today as an Internet Watch Foundation champion and I acknowledge the excellent work that they carry out. Undoubtedly, the, the IWF is one of the most successful hotlines in the world. They have reduced the amount of child sexual abuse content hosted in the UK from 18% in 1996 to less than 1% since 2003. I would th thoroughly recommend that every member in the chamber signs up to be one. Um, as Mark Macdonald had said, they carry out um, such amazing work and um, I would strongly urge people to do that. The internet is one of the greatest inventions of the 20th century. I'm sure we'll all agree that we would be lost without our emails, social media and online shopping. You can access, access information in a matter of milliseconds in volumes which are beyond our mind's capacity to quantify. It is a fantastic tool for educating children and young people. Children and young people can be virtually transported to the four corners of the world, deserts, poor ice caps and mountains high, just with the use of Google Maps. They can watch inspirational speeches from the likes of the Dalai Lama, Martin Luther King and Winston Churchill on YouTube and other monumental events in history. Children and young people can learn to cook, learn a new language, video call a friend on the other side of the world. The internet provides endless opportunities to broaden children's minds and let their boundless imagination flourish. However, whilst the internet provides the vast sea of opportunities for children and young people, it does, as we know, have a sinister side, which has brought us here to debate. From the start, we need robust and concrete guidance for teachers, parents and guardians to ensure that Children and young people are not harmed by the internet and those who abuse it. I welcome the National Action Plan on Internet Safety. It is a step forward in developing an effective way of supporting children and young people whilst tackling the problem of abuse on the internet head on. I hope the plan helps children and young people affected by bullying and as um, the Minister stated, that, that is at the core um, of this as well. And we must tackle the ever-increasing problem of cyberbullying, which has emerged over the past few years. According to NSPCC, one in three children have, been ex have experienced cyberbullying. This is a serious problem which blights children's lives and must be nipped in the bud. In years gone by, bullying mostly stopped at the school gate. Children went home and could escape the problem. Sadly, now in the digital age, the threat reaches beyond this and into our homes. Children and young people can be bombarded with harmful texts and offensive messages on social media 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Particularly using apps such as Snapchat, explicit and inappropriate media have been sent to children and young people. 
Underlying all of these issues, it, and issues is the impact upon children's mental health. Children and young people who are abused online are often silenced by their abusers and are scared to turn to their parents for help. The anxiety and stress that builds in children and young people is often something they cannot describe or explain, and it can leave children and young people in the awful position where they bottle it up, which results in mental health issues later down the line. And given this, I welcome the plan's list of actions in order to tackle online grooming, and children and young people need to be informed of how to be aware if someone is not who they say they are. Deputy President Officer, if we are to ensure our children and young people are safe online, it must be done in a collaborative way, with parents and teachers working together. We must properly implement the National Action Plan on internet safety, but we also must go further than that. It is often easy, particularly for those of us of a slightly older generation to the Minister, to be passive and not to take an interest in how our children use the internet and social media. It is imperative we strike the balance between monitoring our children's activities, but at the same time allowing them the freedom to explore the internet with the necessary knowledge to spot dangers and know how to avoid them. A robust set of guidance and advice would work well to ensure that we can educate parents too on the dangers that can arise from the misuse of the internet. Moreover, the guidance should encourage parents to learn which social media are appropriate for, for their child. With one in five eight to 11 year olds having had some form of social media, it is more important than ever to make sure that parents are aware of what potential problems could arise from young children using these social media platforms. Children and young people are often aren't aware of the pitfalls having an online presence, so their parents have a duty to inform them and keep a track of any posts. On a constructive note, whilst the action plan is a positive step forward, I do believe that it should go further. In order to support parents, I believe that the Scottish Government should provide a parent-friendly website in order to assist parents in the ever-changing world of social media. It could give advice on topics from social media security to spotting signs of online abuse. Teachers, as the plan mentions, must be better informed to educate children and young people on internet safety too. As recent as yesterday in the Education Skills Committee, it was highlighted by trainee teachers that there was very little or nothing on internet safety on the PGDE course. And I welcome the Minister's commitment today um, to provide proper training. Moreover, another significant problem which this plan could go further on is revenge pornography, an abhorrent and cruel act of sharing inappropriate images without permission has a massive negative impact on children and young people's self-esteem, self mental health and perceptions of body image. Sexting and issues associated with sending explicit images has to be addressed. During 2015-16, there were 1,392 counselling sessions on sexting, which is a 15% increase on the previous year. This is very worrying and we simply cannot allow this to increase any further. Often younger children are forced to send images to an abuser and struggle to turn to a parent or teacher when asking for help for fear of being given into trouble. Advice for children and parents must be available, a part of the plan to help children and young people if they are victims of revenge pornography and sexting. So in conclusion, presiding Deputy Spriggan Officer, I welcome the plan put forward by the Minister today and whilst it should be commended as a very positive step forward. It is a delivery and implementation which is important. In my party's amendment, we mentioned that the Parliament must be updated regularly on the progress of the implementation of the National Action Plan. This is crucial to ensure that real progress can be measured and identify areas where improvement needs to be speeded up. It is vital that we can report back to constituents on the plan, as many parents want to see real action taken on this. Furthermore, we would welcome a delivery time scale in order to determine if the action plan is being delivered on time and to give better clarity to the public. The plan does not mention cost implication, implementation and we would like to see this published in the near future. Therefore, when all considered, we have a duty to ensure that the plan is well, well adopted by all stakeholders to tackle 
and stop the problems that can arise in order that our children and young people are safe online. Thank you. I now call on Tavish Scott to speak to and move Amendment 5515.1. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr Scott, uh, around seven minutes. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I uh, broadly agree with the opening remarks of both uh, Mark Macdonald and Annie Wells uh, on the broad uh, spread of internet safety for children and young people? I wanted today to concentrate my brief remarks on uh, young people, how they grow up and how they learn, as much as the legal aspects, the um, issues of uh, safety, the issues of prosecution that... Uh, that both the Minister and Annie Wells uh, mentioned in their uh, opening uh, remarks. Without question, so the social media, uh, the internet, the, the online presence that everyone now has is a double-edged sword. I don't know how many parents uh, my colleagues across the chamber share time with, but it is, at, on one hand, the greatest thing that we've ever had, and on the other hand, the greatest pain in our lives uh, in terms of our children, in terms of the pressures, and in terms of the resilience that we expect of our young people and seek to encourage our young people uh, to have. Uh, I started, uh, I started uh, looking into this uh, the last night uh, and found uh, a Times Educational S uh, Scotland uh, investigation into this very issue. And they began with this, uh, which I thought was important to bear in mind in terms of context. In 370 BC, the Greek philosopher Socrates warned that this newfangled business of writing would lead to forgetfulness in students if they no longer had to remember everything. The advent of the printing press in the 15th century and television in the 20th century sparked the same moral panic. Technology was a dangerous force set to rob our young of their senses, turn brains to mush, and leave society in ruins. Well, none of that happened. Uh, the opposite happened, and it won't happen with the internet either. But Mark McDonald and Annie Wells are quite right that the safeguards we need to put in place are more so with the internet than they've arguably been uh, with uh, learning to write, uh, the printing press, uh, or indeed uh, the television screen. What also strikes me from looking at what's been done about young people learning and, lung, and young people growing up uh, as, uh, on the internet is that there isn't much uh, research, and that's uh, an area that uh, the government may wish to consider for uh, the future. But one social scientist did observe, again to the Times Educational Scotland, uh, that one of the problem areas uh, in terms of linguistic skills that is uh, linked to the growth of the use of the internet is in that the basic skills that we would have expected and do expect of our young people in the ability to listen to someone, to concentrate on what they're saying, to make eye contact, and indeed to have human interaction. It is about the social clues that you get from people when they're talking to you, non-verbal clues, body language, negotiation skills, and turn taking. You don't get that from a computer uh, or a tablet or your mobile phone, uh, even when you're on FaceTime to your seven-year-old, especially when you're on FaceTime to your uh, seven-year-old. And I thought there was much merit in those uh, arguments. Uh, so the evidence argument does seem to me important to consider for the future in terms of how we develop some of the um, proposals that are in the action plan that were, was talked about uh, earlier. Uh, we could go as far as the new president of France who said in his election campaign that he would ban mobile phones for all uh, children under the age of 15 in school. They could leave them at home, they couldn't take them to school. We could do that, but as we lowered the, low low the voting age to 16, uh, I suspect that would be an extremely unpopular policy um, that uh, no government of any political persuasion would bring in. But Macron's making a serious point. He makes a serious point, and teachers reflect that, that to all of us, about the use of mobile phones in schools, uh, what it means, how it invades life, how it invades multiple point classes, uh, and some of the very dangers that Annie Wells uh, rightly highlighted. So how do parents, carers, teachers, and above all young people, cope with this vast influx of information that is at their beck and call? Training and guidance is, as has been mentioned, uh, vital. And that is why I was slightly taken aback by the evidence that uh, young teachers gave to the Education Committee uh, yesterday uh, when they said that in their courses, and no one dissented from this, that there is no training on internet safety, on online safety, as we train the next cohort uh, of men and women who will uh, be the teachers uh, of our future. 
so what I look to, and I'm grateful to the point that uh, the minister made in his in his uh, speech earlier on. But what I do look to uh, is uh, a change in the action plan, or at least a, a, a consideration in the action plan to one of the action points that should specifically and quite clearly draw out the need for um, some kind of module uh, in training. All the controversy yesterday was about the about teacher training only having literacy as one component week in, 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 during the course of that training. Uh, this could be equally said to be um, uh, important in terms of training. Uh, the uh, Minister's Action Plan says on page 14, children and young people will learn about the safe and responsible use of different technologies, including the internet and social media, as part of their broad general education under Curriculum for Excellence. And he's right about that. The Action point, Plan is, of course, right about that. But what it does not say is from whom. And the point I want uh, the government to address um, in the future is to make sure that, yes, uh, teachers are properly supported, and that means, of course, existing teachers, uh, but as importantly, to build in uh, a degree of knowledge and understanding at an earlier age, in other words, in teacher training, uh, and that that should take place uh, for the start of the new uh, teaching academic uh, year. Similarly, I would hope that uh, when uh, the action plan describes the importance uh, of resilience, some considerable attention is given to exactly how that uh, will be uh, taken forward. Because that uh, leads me to uh, the second area that I want to suggest to the Minister, where I do believe some change is necessary, and that is in uh, the use of youth workers uh, to assist in uh, secondary schools, both in broad general education and in the senior uh, phase of secondary schools, for youth workers to assist, where at the moment pupil support structures across most of our secondary schools, if not all, uh, and uh, guidance staff tend to always be promoted teachers. And I believe there is a strong argument now, given not just the need uh, for uh, this area of internet safety to be addressed uh, at that phase and at that time during school, but also the challenges around mental health, or, or the, the other challenges around suicide prevention, the other uh, social challenges that we now just lay on school uh, all the time. And I hope the government would uh, uh, consider carefully, particularly in the context of the clusters that I think are the right approach for the delivery of the future of education, uh, how youth workers can be more involved uh, at, that, at that phase, both in terms of internet safety but in, other, in some of these other areas uh, as well. That uh, youth workers point best made to me by Jim Sweeney and, and YouthLink, who, who made three points to me for this debate today. They said that the, there's a greater need for further resources for the development of and delivery of up-to-date training for youth workers in supporting young people's safety and well-being online. I'm sure that's a point the Minister would uh, readily accept, although I take uh, the usual challenge around resources. Secondly, uh, YouthLink Scotland rightly argue there is a range of training out there and guidance around child protection and policies around social media, but there is not a consistent picture across the sector. All youth work organisations have child protection policies in place. That's absolutely the case in Shetland, with varying degrees of incorporation of social media. Uh, but uh, is there an argument? Well, indeed, there is an argument about consistency. And finally, starting off, sir, uh, YouthLink Scotland co-hosts with Young Scott and Digital Youth Network of Practitioners, uh, and they're looking at how they can future-proof digital social media policies in the coming months. And that, if I may say so, takes me right back to the start, because to argue, as I hope I have, for uh, better uh, teacher training uh, means also recognising that point, that this world never changes, this world never slows down, it never stops, it keeps evolving, it keeps developing. Uh, and to do that means that no part of teacher training and a course design can ever uh, lay in, in aspic. It must uh, steadily evolve. And that in itself is, of course, a challenge. But I hope that uh, in the design of that, our teaching institutions can work with government, with YouthLink Scotland, with other agencies, and rightly, as the Minister made the point, with young people themselves in designing exactly, or indeed not exactly, but it, it designing the broad thrust of a proposal that can make the difference for the young people and the safety we all depend on. Could you move your amendment, please, Mr. Scott? Mr. Presiding Officer, I'll move my amendment. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I call Ian Gray around seven minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. This is uh, an unusual debate in, in a lot of ways. It's an incredibly difficult topic, uh, but not because we differ on the importance or the analysis or uh, even what the solutions uh, might be. No one uh, amongst us, I think, will disagree that our children are at risk, all children. Uh, are at risk, rich or poor, urban, rural, boys, girls. None of us will argue anything except that we must act to protect them. 
The problem is that we are all struggling to understand those risks and struggling even more to develop our responses. Where we normally divide, driven apart by our competing certainties, in this we unite, drawn together, really, by our shared bewilderment. And yet, this is an issue which goes to the heart of the human condition, the challenge of how to be a good parent and ensure the safety of the next generation. And it goes, too, to one of the core dilemmas of modern life, the balance between privacy and security and connectivity and interaction. Now, parenting uh, has never been easy, and there has always been that contradiction between keeping our children from risk and allowing them to engage and grow in the world. And that's as true of cyberspace as it is of physical space. We are, after all, just beginning to understand that perhaps we've become overprotective of children in the real world, curtailing their freedom to play and learn outside the home, when it seems quite suddenly to many of us the greatest risks appear to be in that very home, their bedroom, their school, or even in the pocket where their smartphone lies. As Bernardo's have pointed out in their briefing for today, and indeed as the government motion acknowledges, the rapid development of digital technology is an incredible opportunity for our children, not just a danger. It can provide access to knowledge and information for them in a way that we could not have imagined when we were young. But the risks are real uh, and not exaggerated. Uh, these are risks we struggle to understand, often conducted in a language of acronym, abbreviation and slang which is opaque to us. And they are risks which seem to multiply every day. Just as we come to terms with understanding the potential of the digital world for predators who groom children for their own ends or who multiply the abuse of their victims exponentially online, then we are confronted with the reality of sexting and cyberbullying where the risk lies in our own children and grandchildren's actions and the malice of their peers, not strangers. So how do we proceed? I think we have to start by admitting that we find these risks frightening and difficult to understand. But we have to confront them and find a way to gain that understanding. Back in 2011, the OECD report, the Protection of Children Online, provided some first-class analysis of what they call the topology of risks. It shows us that these risks are multifaceted, but they can be understood as a first step to addressing them. The diversity of these risks takes us to the next principle to which we must aspire, that absolutely everyone has a role to play here. Parents, government, teachers, police, social work, simply everyone, and not least children themselves. The Scottish Government's Action Plan does, I think, recognise that with a series of resources and events aimed at increasing parent awareness, with their participation in the work of Parents Own International and the Internet Watch Foundation. But I do wonder how many parents are aware of these initiatives and actually engaging with them. Mark MacDonald. I, I, I accept that point and I think I accepted it in my speech and that's why what I've committed to doing is to working with parent and carer organisations who I think are often those who are best placed to reach out to some of those parents who perhaps wouldn't access some of the opportunities that already exist out there and perhaps are not as well publicised as they could be. So that's why I've made that commitment to engage with those organisations to try and attract more parents to take an involvement. Well, I, do Ian Green. I do appreciate that response from the Minister very much because it is crucial here, and I really don't mean this as any kind of criticism, but it is crucial that we find a way to go beyond ticking boxes, and there is a danger for all of us that uh, we allow ourselves to be satisfied uh, with that. So that's heartening to hear. The plan, too, uh, has the crucial commitment to the training of professionals in recognising and responding to inappropriate behaviours, bullying or predation online. But as Mr Scott uh, made clear, the Education Committee only yesterday heard from trainee teachers who do not believe their basic preparation uh, for their profession covers this uh, at all. My colleague Daniel Johnson will say some more about that evidence uh, later, but I think it does make the amendment in Tavish Scott's name both sensible and desirable, uh, and uh, I certainly hope the Scottish Government 
uh, will take that on board tonight as well, and I think, I think that they will. For all of us, though, one of the hardest realities to come to terms with is the degree to which it is children themselves who can put themselves at risk or indeed become the perpetrators of abuse. As Bernardos tells us, children and young people are increasingly turning online for information about sex and relationships. And the truth is that we have to be prepared to create an open and realistic attitude to sex if we are ever going to expect them to be open about problems that this may lead them into. We really do have to find ways, legislative if necessary, to ensure that every child receives high quality, age appropriate sex and relationship education. Because every day we fail to do so sees the risk to children exacerbated by their own uncertainty in finding their way in this aspect of life. And finally, the Minister is right. Uh, we have to demand much more in the way of responsibility from the companies who provide, create, and of course profit from the digital technology which is the platform for those risks. How we do that is a whole other vast and difficult topic, I think. And no one can deny, as the, the, the Minister indicated, that the companies have engaged in the likes of Internet Matters, the Internet Watch Foundation and other partnerships. But that does seem to me to scratch the surface of their fundamental responsibility. And they do have a fundamental responsibility for co uh, the, those corporations which are unavoidably the enablers of the risks we are discussing. Presiding officer, I said this is a difficult and often bewildering topic, but that doesn't mean we should talk about it less, but rather talk about it more. This debate itself, this parliament can itself allow ourselves to be a box ticking exercise. And the Conservative amendment, I think, is absolutely right to demand that we return to it regularly. After all, Given the rapidly accelerating development of digital media and the fleeting shortness of those wonderful but vulnerable years of childhood, time is not on our side. Uh, we now move to the open debate. And whilst the speech is generally of six minutes, can I say to members that we do have some time in hand. So uh, interventions are available and perhaps welcome. <laughs> and, uh, and a bit of debate. So can I call, please, Colin Beattie to be followed by Maurice Corey. Presiding officer, the past two decades has seen a tremendous growth in internet use, and that's in no small part thanks to the combined proliferation of social media, ever-increasing broadband speeds, and exponential improvements in handheld technology. I think most of us in the chamber today might recall those days of dial-up modems 15 or 20 years ago when getting even a low-speed internet connection could largely be a game of chance. But nowadays, we rely on the internet for almost anything. Shopping, travel, even booking a haircut. As internet use has risen, we've seen the arrival of a criminal element who take advantage wherever they can. Defined as cybercrime, the actions these individuals and groups take include the theft of intellectual property, attacks against essential services or critical infrastructure, identity theft and fraud, bullying, and finally, sexual exploitation. In the context of Scotland's young people, it is likely that those last two points will be most relevant and most emotionally damaging. The 2015 report by Bernardo's and the Marie Collins Foundation Digital Dangers examined some of the ways that children can be sexually exploited or groomed online, in a few cases without even realizing exactly what's happening. The case of a 14-year-old girl who was groomed online by an older man and subsequently had sex with him may sound typical, but the facts within this case make for surprising reading. The perpetrator was no less than a medical professional who was working with children and young people, while the girl herself is described as a high achiever at school with supportive parents, a close extended family and a good network of friends. And then there's the devastating case of Mary, a 15-year-old who was raped by her boyfriend twice. On the second occasion, the rape was watched by the perpetrator's friends and sexually explicit photos were taken and subsequently passed around Mary's school. As a result, she disengaged from education entirely, has been diagnosed as clinically depressed, has a total lack of self-confidence and motivation, and spends her days on social media, messaging unknown males and sending explicit images of herself on request. 
It seems Mary is only comfortable in her, own, in her online persona and cannot engage with the offline world. And I'm sure everybody in the chamber today will feel tremendous empathy towards Mary and anyone in a similar situation. The teenage years are formative, and whatever experiences we undergo during these years shape us for the rest of our lives. It's very difficult to transcend an experience as overwhelmingly upsetting as that of Mary's. A major part of the issue in protecting young people online is building up a layer of trust with parents. Teenagers want to feel independent, but at the same time, parents want to respect their freedom. Knowing where to draw the line has its pitfalls. The Digital Dangers Report contains several cases where parents have intervened, some in the nick of time to stop abuse, others where the abuse has already started. The report gives some of the reasons why young people did not tell anybody about the abuse they suffered before it was discovered. And these include the highly sexualized nature of the communications, both written and pictorial, feelings of complicity, lying about their age, being in love and having emotional dependency on their online so-called partner, fear of peer group and family responses to their actions. In fact, in some cases, the report refers to the young person remains supportive of their abuser even after discovery, which highlights how comprehensively and insidiously someone can be groomed, particularly when they believe they are in love and are afraid of the response of family and friends. From the evidence given in the Digital da Dangers report, it's clear that keeping children safe online is a highly complex issue with a range of factors to be taken into account. And much of this is reflected in the Scottish Government's recently published National Action Plan on Internet Safety for Children and Young People. And this plan builds on the actions previously set out in the 2010 Action Plan on Child Internet Safety and the 2011 and 12 Scottish Action Plan on Child Internet Safety and Responsible Use, which structured their commitments under three general aims giving everybody the skills, knowledge and understanding to help children and young people to stay safe online, inspiring safe and responsible use and behaviour and creating a safer online environment. In the creation of the recent national plan, the views of a wide range of stakeholders were taken into account, including, crucially, gaining the thoughts of young people through Young Scott, Youth Link Scotland and the Five Rights Youth Commissioners. This feedback has proven invaluable in seeing how Scotland's children and young people see the internet one of the points made was that the internet provides many opportunities, but this is tempered by a feeling that the online and offline worlds are not distinct and that it can be difficult to log off or otherwise disengage from social media. One of the key issues mentioned in the consultation of young people and considered in the national plan is the requirement of social media providers to make it easier to report and block material. For all the background support and information we can provide, there needs to be a clear and straightforward method for end users to report unsuitable material directly to providers and for the subsequent appropriate action to be taken. And I'm pleased to see that the National Plan confirms that the Scottish Government has successfully made links with the like of Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat and Google to discuss internet safety for the young people who use the various platforms and how safety can be better promoted in this media. To date, the Scottish Government has already taken a range of steps to help promote internet safety. For example, they provide £100,000 of funding to the Five Rights Coalition, which believes that children and young people must be empowered to access the digital world creatively, knowledgeably and fearlessly. Now, we can support these rights going forward by taking a number of me measures outlined in the National Plan. And some of the examples are working with Parent Zone International in the planning and delivery of an internet safety summit for professionals who work with parents. We'll promote and update the 360 degree tool, a program that enables schools and organizations to self-evaluate against a detailed set of e-safety criteria. And we'll work with the Marie Collins Foundation to pilot the Click Path to Protection training module, which is targeted at professionals charged with safeguarding children who have been sexually abused and exploited online. And finally, we'll work with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service to deliver a summit next month on sexual offending and young people. These are just a few examples outlined in the Scottish Government's National Action Plan. And when all the evidence is examined, there can be no doubt that protecting young people on the internet is a complex issue with many factors to be taken into account. The internet has become the near essential facet of modern life, particularly for those of a younger generation. And as with many things that become significant at a pace that outstrips legislation, governments can find themselves playing catch-up. However, while this is not an issue on which we can stand still, 
I do believe that the steps that are being taken are the right ones to help ensure Scotland's young people can browse the web and use social media safety, safely and without fear of exploitation. May I have Maurice Corey to be followed by Gillian Martin. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, firstly, I must say that ensuring that our children and young people are safe online is incredibly important. And I can say this as a parent with three daughters and one son who seem to live permanently on their internet devices, but I must say they act very responsibly, or well, it certainly seems that way, thank goodness. <coughs> as more, thank you. As more and more young people are spending their time online and as the internet continues to play an increasing role in our society, ensuring that young people are safe online is becoming a larger part of looking after the overall welfare of our young people. Access to the internet of the 21st century offers young people incredible opportunities that my own generation were unfortunate to miss out on. Children today can benefit from access to unlimited educational resources, the ability to communicate with friends and members of the family worldwide and across many global places, and the, the chance to organize social events amongst friends. We can see that across the board, youngsters are taking full advantage of their access to the internet. One in 58 11-year-olds and seven in 1,012 15-year-olds now have a social media profile. On the whole, actively, activity conducted on the internet by youngsters is carried out in a positive and safe manner. However, unfortunately, the online environment isn't always a welcoming one. This is highlighted by the fact that one in four children have experienced something that was upsetting on a social networking site and have come across racist or hate messaging online where one in three have themselves been a victim of cyberbullying. These figures are just what the children admit to have seen online as there are, without doubt, many children who will be unwilling to speak openly about their experience, even to their parents. It is a big area, an issue amongst our young people, and for one, I am glad we are debating it in the Chamber today, as the NSPCC has noted an increase of 13% in the number of counselling sessions where cyberbullying was mentioned between 2014-15 and 2015-16. This is a huge rise, and one we have to take very seriously. I firmly believe that education is going to play a big part in helping young people deal with issues which they are going to face online. And that's why I'm glad to see that the National Action Plan on Internet Safety for Children and Young People include measures to help boost education on this issue. Preempting the issues and helping young people build their own resistance and resilience, as the plan suggests, is a good idea. I think that the promotion of the 360 degree safe tool in particular is an excellent way to help ensure that our children are safer online. And this tool allows schools and organizations online systems to be rated five to one on various aspects of internet safety. This will help allow schools especially to home in on the areas that need to be improved upon to allow their pupils to continue to enjoy a safe access to the internet. Furthermore, if young people know how to identify the issues, then understand how to address these, they will be able to keep themselves secure and safe online. This will allow them to continue to reap the benefits of access to the internet. I think the work of Parent Zone is also worth mentioning at this point. It is an organization that offers digital parenting training courses which aim to educate parents and others on how to make sure children use the internet in a responsible and safe manner. Educating parents as well as children is hugely important so that they can set a positive example for their children to follow. And I certainly would welcome that because I certainly was not a parent who was trained on that. I know as a parent myself that although my children are now slightly older than the targeted group, I would have appreciated the online teaching resources for adults. I know that it would have helped me teach my children how to use the internet safely and understand it. I understand that there are many adults in the same boat as me who even today may not have grown up with regular access to the internet and need a bit of extra support. It is great that the Parent Zone are offering this service and so I am glad to see that the Scottish Government are going to hold a Parent Internet Safety Summit alongside Parent Zone International which will hopefully be a stepping stone towards helping all parents look after their children online. Deputy Presiding Officer, in conclusion, we welcome the Scottish Government's National Action Plan on Internet Safety for Children and Young People. We strongly encourage them to, in to continue to work closely with charities, schools and parents. However, we note that the key to success in this area is not in publishing the plan, but actually ensuring that it is actioned and implemented and works for every child in Scotland. Thank you. 
Can I, can I remind members that, that we do still have some time in hand, and uh, the alternative is that we all rely on Mr Stevenson. So, <laughs> think on. <laughs> can I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Claire Baker? Thank you, presiding officer. When you have teenagers, you walk a fine line between giving them freedom and trust to find their own path and keeping a watchful eye to protect them, as many people have already mentioned. I am a mum to a 14-year-old who doesn't like me mentioning her in my speeches, so you ain't seen me, right? <laughs> my speech today comes from a personal place, that of a mum who's struggling to know how safe my child is online and what I can do to protect, protect her. Um, and I, I want to commend the government on taking action with the measures outlined by the Minister today. Last month in my constituency, a very brave young girl went public about her experiences online. Um, she went to the press with the assistance of her mother because she wanted what had happened to her to act as a warning to other young people. She was coerced by an older boy to take naked photographs of herself and send them to him via Snapchat. These images were then circulated wildly, widely by the boy and his friends. And on realising what happened, the girl went to her mother for help. When the mother what the mother found on her daughter's phone were messages from quite a few older boys of an inappropriate nature. And there was constant badgering for nude images. Very quickly, those boys had the police at their door and investigations are taking place. The girl is only 11 years old. What happened to this girl prompted me to have a discussion on this with my own daughter and her friends who were around at my house that night. They told me that nudes for nudes was something that a lot of people at their school did, not them of course. And it turns out that the exchange wasn't just about getting an adolescent thrill between teens flirting with one another online, but it could lead to bullying as those with images would threaten others who'd sent them. Girls would threaten other girls, they told me. They spoke of one girl in their school who had a collection of images of her so-called friends that could be deployed at will should she ever feel the need to humiliate them online. This very frank, illuminating and, to be honest, terrifying conversation prompted me to get together with my constituency's newly elected members of the Scottish Youth, Youth Parliament to work together on a project. After exam time, we are planning a closed forum for young people from all the schools in our area to allow them to highlight the issues they face online. As a result of this forum, we're going to put together an action plan on how we can raise awareness on online bullying, which is absolutely rife, and how we can help parents, teachers, and young people know how to tackle the problems, myself included. Children need to be made aware that what they might do impulsively for fun can have serious repercussions. Once that photo leaves their phone and is sent to someone else, they have no control over where it goes and how many people see it. And additionally, we have to make people who solicit these images aware that they could face criminal charges. People soliciting these images, they aren't just the bogeyman and the monster they're not the, the older man or, or, or the, the child sex predator. They're young adolescent males who really think that they're doing really no harm. I'm not giving them any excuses for this, but you could, as a parent of a 19-year-old boy, I would be absolutely horrified if he was in a position where the police were at my door for something that he thought was just a joke or uh, innocent. Those school children who encouraged that 11-year-old girl to pose for those photographs must surely now be regretting their actions. And just yesterday, a man was convicted in Aberdeen Sheriff Court for sending a nude image of himself to a young girl via Snapchat. Young adults not only put themselves at risk when they send images, they could also face charges, criminal charges for both sending and receiving images from an underage child. Presiding officer, I asked my two members of the Scottish Youth Parliament to contribute to my speech, so I'm, I'm going to end with their words. This is from uh, Josh McRae, MSYP, uh, who goes to Inverurie Academy. He said, Many young people are unaware of the consequences of posting an inappropriate photograph of themselves or a peer and how quickly an embarrassing photograph or video can spread online. And finally, this from Evie Robertson, 
MSYP from Old Meldrum Academy, which I think nails the issue. Evie says, Nowadays, young people often feel pressurised to say or do things and often broadcast them on social media, often seemingly harmless at first. However, it can then escalate to very hurtful comments and this often has a very damaging effect on the victim and their mental health. There's also the looming pressure to send indecent images to other people via social media. There's often very little that can be done to prevent the spread of images once they're sent, but if we can educate younger children before they reach their teenage years, then we may have a chance to reduce incidents of images being sent in the first place. Finally, presiding officer, before I sit down, I'm going to frighten the life out of everyone with one statistic, I'm afraid. The FBI and the US have said that by their estimation, at any given moment, there are 750,000 child predators online at any given moment. Images can end up on their screens. Evie's right, educating children before they reach their teenage years is vital to protect them. As with many things, education is the key. I have Claire Baker to be followed by Kate Forbes. Uh, thank you, President Officer. So today we are debating the National Action Plan on Internet Safety for Children and People and Young People. And within this document, there are lots of good projects. There are local, Scottish, UK and international projects uh, all working in this field. And it is a very complex picture. And to be honest, I wasn't always convinced that it is coordinated. That is not to question the dedication of the people and organisations who are working on the issue or the positive contribution they are making on children and young people. But there is a lack of a strategic framework or strategic intent. I do recognise in the foreword the Minister says it is an important step, but I would appreciate a clearer and stronger statement of intent and analysis from the government. I recognise the Minister says a progress report will be published in 2019, which it says may set out further actions that will reflect the rapid evolution of online technologies and our need to ensure we respond appropriately. I am concerned that this doesn't keep pace with some of the challenges we are facing. Um, it is a wide-ranging document, but there are a few aspects of it which I wish to focus on. For all the positive aspects that the internet brings to our lives, it is too often used as a destructive tool, and child abuse and exploitation can be facilitated and supported through the internet, through grooming, through the sharing of images and videos, through using it to contact other abusers and then create networks. The, network, the internet gives greater potential for all this activity, and while the action plan focuses on Scotland, we know that this type of child exploitation often focuses on some of the poorest countries in the world, the countries that sit outside the reach of our legislation. Alongside this vile industry, and it's clear to see that that is what it is, but alongside this vile industry, I would argue, is a more complex picture of our society where it is normalised among young people and young adults, um, where it intersects be between what is legal and, and what is criminal. We have a society where it is common for celebrities to record sex tapes, where it is common for sexuality and self-worth to be interpreted and judged visually, where intimate images are leaked, but it is acceptable um, and is expected that the images had been taken, where pornography is much more widely available and the regulation of the internet is pretty ineffective in restricting access to this from children and young people. The risks that the majority of children in Scotland face with the internet are bullying and being able to access inappropriate materials. For those who are more at risk, we must ensure that there are comprehensive services to support these children who are victims of child exploitation and abuse, and we must always be vigilant. And young people who are sexually exploited by adults, in this country, largely teenage girls, though Gillian Martin's example was of an 11-year-old girl, so I think we need to be aware. Um, but I would say, you know, largely teenage girls, pupubescent girls, sometimes exploited by criminal gangs or organised groups. They need the intelligence and the prioritisation of our police force. They need the intervention of the criminal justice system. They need authorities to recognise their vulnerability. And they need none of us to turn a blind eye to this kind of behaviour. But if you look at young people, say 13 to 18 on average, their experience is quite different. Their social platforms are a significant part of their lives. Uh, the consultation with young people within the document tells us that they felt the online and the offline worlds are not distinct, that young people don't differentiate between the two. 
78% of 12 to 15-year-olds hold a mobile phone, with 65% of them having a smartphone. That fundamentally changes human interaction and relationships to any experience that any of us had, a, had as teenagers. I mean, it just must do. Maybe the action plan needs to distinguish between what protected online means for children and what that means for young people. For example, if you accept the importance and the primacy of the image, then sexting just becomes part of that culture. And that is complex when you're dealing with young people and their relationships. We have legislated to address some of these issues and the Abusive Behaviour and Sexual Harm Act and criminalises non-consensual sharing of intimate images, while the 2005 and the 2009 Sexual Offences Acts both focus on preventing the sexual exploitation of children and young people. But as the action plan recognises, this is a complex set of circumstances, describing examples of online exploitation as the sending and sharing of indecent images, including self-produced images, and once the child or the young person begins to participate in such activities, they leave themselves open to being blackmailed into further participation. This coerciveness might not always be obvious to the child and the young person, as the grooming is so powerful they can come to believe it as acceptable behaviour. And then within this example and this small set of circumstances, there is also the scenario where the image is self-reduced, but it's lifted from its intended space and it is then promoted through child sexual exploitation websites. Also, there's a scenario where the image is being willingly sent to another young person who then decides to share it with their friends. And Gillian Martin accurately described the reality for some young people, the severity of some bullying that takes place, the criminality um, of some behaviour that has actually been normal normalised by, um, by youth culture. So I think we need a more sophisticated understanding of young people, of the pressures that they are facing and the extent to which the internet has changed their relationships. Um, I was aware of the research being carried out by Edinburgh University into self-produced sexual images by adolescents. This is an important piece of work in thinking about how we respond to this. Uh, there is also interest in research being done in Canada who have been, uh, where academics have been consistently monitoring young people's behaviour over a number of years to look at their change in attitudes towards relationships and sexuality. Uh, when I first came into the role of justice spokesperson for Labour, I had a meeting with the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General and discussed some of these issues. And I am pleased that the summit we discussed on sexual offending and young people is being arranged for later this year. I think that will be an important conference. We currently have a situation where young people below and above the age of consent are getting themselves into serious criminal trouble because they are either not understanding the law or they're ignoring the law. And situations where alcohol is involved, where filming is involved, where social media and the internet are being widely used, where actions which seem acceptable to the perpetrator and often to their peers are actually unlawful. And I believe that this summit will be an opportunity to raise the profile of these challenges. So how do we make sure that young people understand that the legal framework is relevant to their lives and to their experience? Are young people not necessarily accepting, but are they more tolerant of hypersexualization of young women and masculinities of young men? Is their understanding of relationships a cause for concern or is it a sign of the times? And while we must be clear about the legal framework and be firm when the law is broken, an action plan for internet safety operates within our society. The way in which young people use it, manage it, live in it is a symptom of our society. We need a societal approach to change attitudes, to empower young people within their relationships and to limit exploitation within relationships in order to equip young people with the understanding they now need in the modern world. I call Kate Forbes to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In one sense, the internet and I have grown up together. It all started with emails painstakingly typed out and then sent to the sound of the dial-up's muffled shriek. And then in my mid-teens, we'd all go home from school and resume our school chat on MSN Messenger or the first online social media sites like Bebo. And since then, through my later teens and into my 20s, we've had a never-ending stream of enterprising means for communicating and sharing our lives more freely than we could have in the physical world. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Snapchat. And all of that has gone, grown hand in hand 
with mobile devices so that it's easier to access anywhere, well, except in the not spots of the Highlands. The internet is now thoroughly embedded in children's daily lives. It has transformed play and education. And as the minister said, it's overtaken TV in terms of children's viewing. Children are going online at younger ages, still largely at home and then secondly at school. And I still find it remarkable watching toddlers navigating an iPad for only the second time with greater speed and skill than their parents who've been using it for years. And so to a greater extent than the physical world, the virtual world brings out the best and the worst in people. There's greater potential for raising money for charities, raising awareness of global injustice, and raising the educational attainment of people everywhere, literally everywhere. But that ease of access, that speed of development, and the unregulated nature of the internet means that there is less restraint in its use. And so I want to touch on three very, very different risks and challenges. The accessibility of explicit content, the abuse of children, particularly in other countries, to meet demands in Scotland. And then lastly, something that is quite different, the normalising of perfect lives on social media. So firstly, the internet facilitates and enables pure evil to flourish in the darkest of corners. And at the very heart of the most sinister, ominous evil online are real people perpetrators and victims. Tavish Scott mentioned the important role of research in the use and regulation of the internet. And research by independent comparison service uswitch.com a few years ago in 2014 showed that three million UK families had discovered their children viewing violent and explicit material on the internet, with the youngest age quoted being two years old. And perhaps most worryingly, Uswitch's research found that three quarters of parents could not name any parental control tools that could be applied to internet-enabled devices, and four in ten said that they had none installed. So the Scottish Government's commitment in the National Action Plan to engage with parents and carers, to empower parents and carers to support their children's online activity and deliver an internet safety summit in Scotland is very important. But, presiding officer, if children can be, view, can, be view, can be victims as viewers, they are even more so as those who are trafficked to be sexually abused online. Cyber sex trafficking is the live streamed sexual abuse of children viewed over the internet, and it is growing at an alarming rate, fuelled by the behaviour of people in Scotland and around the world. Some of us went to uh, a really eye opening event hosted by Jenny Mara with International Justice Mission. And my colleague Gillian Martin has a motion, which I would urge you all to sign, condemning this cyber sex trafficking. IGM rescue some of these trafficked victims, and 54% of victims rescued in IJM cases are 1 to 12 years old. Victims can be exploited in any location with a computer and the internet or just a mobile phone. And as International Justice Mission states, slavery and freedom are in the power of our phones. And the not on my screen conversation which IGM has launched needs all of our voices. But, presiding officer, with the time left, I, find I want to come back home and talk about something that is quite easily um, passed by when talking about the damaging effects of the internet. I think it, it's very important that we're aware that it's not just the obviously unacceptable and explicit content that is of concern. It's also the way in which social media can distort normality. It allows us all to present the best of ourselves, the best filter for the best photograph, the best description of the best moments, the best new outfit for the best body image. And there are great risks of cultivating personas and perfect lives on social media, which leads to anxieties around body image and self-esteem. And that's for men and women, for boys and girls. And that's when pro-self-harm, pro-anorexia sites and cyber bullying can thrive because reality never matches the soft glow of Nashville or Sierra, which are just two of the many Insta filters. And parents and teachers have a very challenging job to remind our young people again and again that their value is not found in the number of likes for our Instagram picture or the number of friends we have on 
Facebook, and maybe that's a good reminder for politicians too, our value is found and our young people's value is found in their inherent dignity and worth with their unique characteristics and talents. And that is where the National Action Plan is so right to highlight that only collaboration, and a number of other speakers have touched on this as well, that it's only collaboration with parents and children at the heart between schools, families and government policy can meet these challenges and nobody can do it alone. Thank you very much, Ms. Forbes. Paul Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Mr. Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Officer. I, I feel uh, even older uh, now than I did before Kate Forbes spoke. Uh, as a person who left school when one computer just had arrived and only the slight geeky mathematicians and, and uh, people like that got to use them, um, I certainly haven't grown up with the internet. It's uh, way ahead of me. This is a deeply serious subject, and I, like others, welcome this debate this afternoon. Like my colleague Annie Wells, I am a IWF champion. All of us receive briefings from the third sector, from companies on a regular basis. And I think perhaps the most harrowing one was the one that I received from them of the impact that child pornography has on so many vulnerable lives. Not just here, fortunately, it less so here in Scotland, but across our world. The internet has turned our world upside down. It has revolutionized communication. It is now, as we've already heard, the preferred medium that most young people go to. My two five-year-old girls can now switch on my iPhone and find some kind of YouTube program quicker than I can stop them. Now, at the moment, we are left with Fireman Sam or Teletubbies or whatever. But as they grow older, that concerns me as a parent. Cyberbullying goes on. All forms of bullying, as we debated just a couple of weeks ago in this chamber, is wrong. But cyberbullying goes with you into your bedroom, into your house, a Saturday, Sunday. Sadly, my niece, not living here in Scotland, but in Norway, a few years ago, was very badly bullied on Facebook. As a young teenage girl, she had nowhere to hide. She couldn't leave it behind at school. And I think there is a responsibility on educationists, on uh, parents, on uncles, on aunts, to be aware of what is going on and simply not to say, well, it always has happened. Today, I think it has become a lot worse. Breaking down basic privacy of your bedroom can never help anyone. And so along with my party, I welcome the launch of the National Action Plan on Internet Safety for Children and Young People. We agree that we want to see the protection that this hopefully will give. I'm pleased that the Minister and the Government have not only sought the views of experts, of parents, of teachers, but have gone deliberately out of their way to find out what young people think. After all, they are the ones that know far more about technology than perhaps, excluding maybe Kate Forbes, anyone else in, even in this chamber. We need to develop a plan that is appropriate that works and that has the support of the majority of our country. The Think You Now website, which has targeted children and different aid bands, again, empowers young people, gives them information, but not only young people, but perhaps as importantly, information to adults as well. Again, I think we all welcome the number of action points identified in the action plan. I welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to work with digital media providers and industry to ensure parents, carers, families, as well as children and young people 
have access to appropriate information and support. I think there is still more that the digital industry can do to leave the way. I think they are moving in the right direction, but perhaps we need carrots and sticks as we go on this journey together. Awareness is perhaps the key thing. This is not something that just a few, but the majority need to know about. I, I welcome the amendment again in my colleague's name. And I, I would just maybe come back and ask the Minister to reflect on, do we need to put in shorter timescales to review this? Uh, again, I accept 2019 in some ways doesn't feel too long away. It's after all, only what, two years away. But two years in regard to what's happening with IT, I think is probably too far. And we don't want to get bungled down, as uh, Ian Gray has said, by ticking boxes and filling out forms. But I do think there needs to be maybe some kind of review sooner than that, just to see what progress we are making. But as I've said, I, I welcome this. I think it is the right step forward. And I'm very happy that I'll be able to support not only the government motion, but the two amendments as well this evening. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you, Mr. Valfer. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Monica Lennon. Mr. Stevenson, please. And as you know, I don't know whether I should say this to you, Mr. Stevenson, but we can be generous with time. I'm sure you'll have an anecdote somewhere. Uh, well, that's very generous. I'll try and not abuse your trust. And that's two deputy presiding officers who've made that offer to me, so I'd be very impolite not to make use of it. Um, presiding officer, when we go online, we're confronted with a series of risks. Now, it is worth saying I worked on my first online system in the 1960s, and I sent my first email in 1980, and I first did my online banking using a public network in 1983. Uh, so, I have a long history, and others will similarly have a long history. Yes, that might even be before some of the previous speakers were born. <laughs> I, I, I will, yes. I trust this is about his long history, Mr. I'm just wondering, in the context of his recent remarks, whether you could confirm, uh, in relation to Tavish Scott's remarks, whether he was indeed alive when Socrates first caused consternation <laughs> regarding writing. Mr. Stevenson. Uh, my great-uncle Socrates... Uh, <laughs> has said many wise things and we will continue to draw from the well of knowledge of the Greek and Roman philosophers. Uh, but let's return to matters more local um, and in particular the internet. Now, many of us uh, will know nothing of the real risks and if we were explained all the risks out there, we might not understand what they are. New risks are being created deliberately or accidentally every single day. One of the things I believe, and I will turn to this in more detail later, is that we should detect better those who are creating risks so that we can hunt them down with the force of law. Now, for children, who are the focus of today's debate, there are very special risks. Being presented with material, let me describe it simply as being beyond their age, carries with it the potential of psychological damage that could endure throughout their lives. Their brains are plastic. The brain is future operation is more affected by present and past experience and knowledge than an adult's brain is. Children have not yet acquired an adult set of critical faculties that enable the filtering out and discarding of inappropriate material. They comparatively lack the power to discriminate. To express a very complex piece of science, probably over simply, until puberty, uh, many of our memories seem to be literal. We remember pictures and sounds. This is eidetic memory. As we become adults, our memory moves to an interpretive memory where we remember the meaning of our experiences and preference to simply retaining a picture in our brain. That's much more convenient because it enables us to create an index to retrieve information. So just as we protect youngsters from physical danger, we need to protect them from psychological danger. So what, therefore, are the particular dangers? As in the physical world, we want our young to avoid unsavory characters who might exploit, abuse, or otherwise harm them as individuals. We want them to avoid engagement with potentially corrupting material. We want to protect 
their personal assets, however modest they may be. As adults, we mostly have the wherewithal to a fair degree uh, to monitor and guide a youngster's contact with the world and the people in it. We understand the physical world pretty well. But the focus of the plans we discussed today is towards helping our children access the internet in a safe way. And that is both necessary and helpful that we should do so. But the online story is highly complex and rapidly evolving. There are about 4 billion people online. And there are many more identities than that. Multiple identities abound on the internet. Now, if you choose to interact with me on Twitter, and this will be true for most of us here, uh, in my case at ZS Stevens, I'll repeat that in case you want to hear it again, <laughs> ZS Stevens, you'll see a little tick in a blue circle next my name. Uh, that means that Twitter has verified that I am who I say I am. And that's quite an important thing, because relying on this, in the case of Twitter, removes a source of ambiguity of identity that enables much, but not all, of the risk in the online world. All responsible media providers need to make available similar identity-proved facilities. There is already a certification system available for websites, the best websites you access uh, via uh, HTTP protocol 1080. There's an S goes at the end. There's a lock appears saying that that website has a certification. We now need robust and unbypassable software, perhaps required by law, perhaps enforced at ISPs and at an appropriate point in the future, that can restrict communication only to verified online entities, in particular entities that purport to be real people. Now, some international examples. Estonia suffered the most extreme cyber attack from Russian-based hackers some 10 years ago. The history is more than I have time to explain. Today, their e-resident and other initiatives are transforming the small Baltic state into a world leader in creating a safe online world for citizens in their business lives. At 100 euros a pop, it remains too expensive for mass deployment for all. This is an Estonian e-resident card. It's a paper copy of one. I haven't spent the 100 euros. Uh, but in the post-Brexit world, there are a lot of UK citizens are looking at becoming Estonian e-residents because of the advantage it gives. Now, Jamie Green didn't directly refer to it, but essentially that system gives you the ability to electronically sign anything that you put on the internet. That protects the integrity of your communication and protects the receivers of it. The website Wired describes Estonia as the most advanced digital society in the world. There are other small nations uh, that are our near neighbors, Macedonia, Serbia, Albania, and Croatia, that are doing legislative work in this area and looking at electronic systems. They have what appears to have be a disadvantage, but in this circumstances, an advantage of having comparatively undeveloped infrastructures. They're leapfrogging present technologies into different futures. Let's look at India for another approach. In 2009, the Indian government launched a massive project called ADAR to provide a digital identity to everyone based on an individual's fingerprints and retina scans. As of 2016, the program has issued 12-digit identification numbers to 1.1 billion people. It's believed to be the largest and most successful IT project in the world has created the foundations for a digital economy. It's voluntary, but almost everyone from the totally illiterate to the billionaire banker wants to be part of it. And indeed, they are currently running a competition for youngsters um, to produce 30-second videos uh, to support uh, other youngsters to get engaged with the internet and the ad bar uh, system in an appropriate way. By possessing unambiguous proof of identity and, and appropriate technology, Indian citizens can effect cashless transfer of value without banks, without central record, without worries. They can open bank accounts without the hassle that we have to because they've got an assured identity that they can use to do so. That's the kind of initiative that creates potential for a safe environment online generally for adults and for children alike when they are online. 
So what actually can technology make possible? And it's here today, it just ain't implemented in this way. We can, for every image, for every text book, for every blog, for everything on the internet, we can today market uncorruptibly and verifiably so that you know who the individual who has produced it is. And if we could do that, that creates for law enforcement the possibility to hunt down the wrongdoers. If you can require that it is to be done, can you? Yes, you can. You could require the internet service providers through which all internet traffic flows to always check that they only pass through to their subscribers things that have been digitally signed. So there are some difficulties with that, of course. We have anonymous hotlines. We need to have them as part of the check and balances of our system. So can that be dealt with? I'll come back to that in a moment. Software, verified identity, and law can complement the kind of plans within our government's paper. There's no time to waste. We could be world leaders in this, uh, although others have got a bit, uh, got out of the starting blocks uh, fairly easy. I'm very happy to support the government's plan as, as it is. Now, let me just talk a little bit about how you deal with uh, uh, hotlines and whistleblowing. I'll but give you a little bit more time. I'm nearly I, there. I feel Presider. I'm at a seminar, and it's very interesting. All right. I'm, but I'm, uh, I, I won't give other people extra time. No, no, I'm nearly, I'm nearly there, presiding officer. Um, one of the ways you can deal with proper use of anonymity is, of course, to license a restricted number of servers within that can receive material that is unsigned. They then would have the responsibility of looking at that material and republishing it with their signature, having verified that it's appropriate so to do. So there are ways, even in the world where you require everyone to have an identity, that you can protect the rights of those who properly need to be uh, anonymous. Now, in my contribution, I've simply tried to say there are some things we could do in the long term. I certainly could speak for hours on the subject, but your generosity is much appreciated. Beware, there are many simplifications in what I've said. If you really want the seminar, I should be in the bar at five o'clock. <laughs> well, that's what I call using up extra time. Monica Lennon, followed by Jamie Green. Miss Lennon, follow that. Thank you, <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer. I fear that I won't be anywhere near as interesting as Stuart Stevenson, so no pressure there. I also welcome the government's motion today, as well as amendments from Tavish Scott, who I don't know where he's gone, uh, and Annie Wells. The publication of the National Action Plan on Internet Safety for Children and Young People <coughs> will play a crucial role in making sure that our children and young people can be protected when they are online. Scottish Labour is committed to developing a comprehensive strategy to increase online safety in partnership with charities, internet service providers, parents and other stakeholders. So it's very much welcome to see this National Action Plan published by the government. As we've heard today, the internet is now part of the daily fabric of life for the vast majority of people and children born in today's world will never have known life without it. With that, of course, as we've already heard from many other contributions this afternoon, comes a range of new opportunities and risks that must be navigated. On the positive side, and there are many, the potential that smartphones and the internet opens up for our young people is boundless. They have so much accessible information at their fingertips, more so than any previous generation. The benefit that brings in terms of the potential for increasing their knowledge and education is almost immeasurable. And I see this, these benefits amongst my, my, for my own daughter and her friends. Um, I may go home tonight and set my 11 year old a, a task to perhaps fact check Stuart Stevenson's speech and perhaps she could come back with a, uh, Mr. Stevenson's family tree, that would be most interesting. But of course, Deputy Presiding Officer, this unfettered access to information and the rest of the virtual world needs to be balanced against the responsibility that all adults have to ensure that our children can be protected. As Bernardo Scotland have outlined in their briefing today for today's debate, and other members have mentioned, including Ian Gray, the concerns around children's safety online is often characterised by stranger danger. The fear that an adult stranger will use messaging apps or social media to groom a young person for sexually exploitative purposes. 
The immediate analogy that always seems to come to mind it, as a parent, you would never let your young child go out on their own, unsupervised, in a place where they would be surrounded by adult strangers and be put in a potentially dangerous situation. But with access to smartphones and the internet, even where there are parental controls on access, the outside world and its potential dangers is suddenly so much more accessible to young people in the very places that they should be most safe, in the home and in school. And I can think of many examples of children who I know uh, in my constituency who have set up accounts, whether it's on Snapchat or Instagram or elsewhere, that their parents have no knowledge of and certainly haven't given their consent to. So making sure that parents, professionals and young people themselves have the ability to recognise and respond to the potential issues around online behaviour is crucial. And that's why the actions contained in the latest plan are very much welcome. As previously stated, the amendment to the government's motion in Tavish Scott's name is one that I also welcome. Teachers must be properly trained, supported and equipped to deal with issues around the online behaviour of young people. And as I've been listening to the contributions uh, today, it's also made me return to Scottish Labour's proposal for school-based counselling, uh, a, a plan that Bernard of Scotland uh, indeed supports, because I've heard several members talk about the, the impact on young people's mental health. And I know that all of us want to intervene early to make sure the young people get the support that they need, and ideally within the school setting. Young people's lives are inextricably intertwined with ever-changing technology. Parents, teachers or any other adults involved in the care of children can't pop properly help or support young people face the challenges in their lives if we don't always also have an understanding of the methods they're using to communicate with each other. Whether it be apps like Snapchat or Instagram, the way in which young people communicate is key to many of the potential issues that can be damaging to them. The sharing of nasty or abusive messages or the creation and sharing of exploitative or embarrassing images over social networking sites and smartphones between young people can pose just as much of a risk to our children than that fear of stranger danger. And the fact that young people have access to these ways of communicating at such a young age, when they're still developing and maturing, makes the case for age-appropriate relationship education all the more pressing. I'd like to pay tribute to Gillian Martin. Um, she's not in her seat, unfortunately, hope she's still listening, because I thought she gave a, an excellent and insightful speech and uh, I commend the steps that she's taking in partnership with the members of the Scottish Youth Parliament in her area to really tackle this issue. I have an 11 year old daughter, um, the same age as the constituent that Gillian referred to, Gillian Martin referred to, and um, Although none of us are naive to these things going on, when you hear it and you hear a very uh, real example, it does send a, a shiver down your spine. It's, it's, it's horrible. So all of us have a responsibility to make sure that young people understand the consequences of sharing sexually exploitative images of themselves and their peers. And we've heard why there needs to be a greater understanding in the curriculum of young people's rights about consent and about what makes a healthy relationship. With young people more and more likely to be turning to the internet for information on sex and relationship matters, it's imperative that the education system is keeping pace with that. A rounded education is only possible if it's set in the context of understanding the pressure and expectations that the internet brings, as well as understanding how our young people perceive the world through that prism. I know that the Scottish Government have committed to a review of personal and social education in the 10-year mental health strategy, and it's crucial, in my view, that this review reflects the concerns that have been raised today in this debate and is cognizant of this in the, the action plan. It would certainly be a welcome move to have the curriculum updated to reflect the fast-paced changes in technology in recent years, so that our teachers have the support they need to deal with these issues too. Perhaps that's something the Minister can elaborate on in summing up. In closing, Presiding Officer, the publication of the National Action Plan is a welcome step forward in the attempt to improve the safety of our young people when they are online. I look forward to seeing its progress over the coming months. Thank you very much, Ms Lennon. I call Jamie Green to be followed by Ruth Maguire. And Ruth Maguire will be the last speaker in the open debate.
Mr Green, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I first of all, should refer members to my register of interests, which is a voluntary statement on my ownership of internet domains. Uh, the challenges in keeping uh, young people safe uh, online stem from the fact that technology and the pace of changing technology is so fast, uh, especially over the last 10 years. Uh, when I was young, we had no internet, uh, no mobile phones, and dare I say, we used to write letters to each other. I know. But for all the benefits that technology brings, it's fair to say that it brings many dangers, and we spoke about that in great length today. Uh, just this week in the Parliament, I welcomed uh, a group of P7 students from Glen Garnet campus in North Ayrshire, a group of 11 and 12 year olds uh, to the education services in the Parliament. Uh, and every single one of them owned a smartphone. I asked the question uh, whilst I was there, knowing I had this debate coming out this week. Uh, and when I told them that I was speaking in the debate about uh, uh, you know, what the government is doing to try and improve safety for children online, I said to them that, you know, they should know that not everyone on the internet is who they say they are. And I have to say I was quite surprised by the response. Uh, lots of them were nodding in agreement, but some of them looked quite confused and bewildered by that comment. And I think therein lies the problem. Uh, so I think I support this, uh, this action plan for that very reason, is that there are still many young people out there uh, who have access to the internet uh, and smartphones and tablets, uh, possibly using apps that their parents don't know exist, never mind that they're downloaded onto their devices, but yet aren't quite familiar with the concept that not everyone is who they say they are. The word collaboration has been used many times today, and I think that's absolutely key. Uh, therefore, I welcome the government's commitment to work with the UK government on the age verification provisions within the Digital Economy Bill, which has uh, recently gone through Westminster. I think that's a very positive step. Um, a collective responsibility falls on all governments, I think, to ensure that the internet is a safe environment, or is at least as safe as it can be. I also welcome the Minister's commitment to engage on uh, legislation or around legislation on the right to remove element of this. My personal view is that much more can be done on this, either formally or informally, on this problem. Uh, the, the Action Plan talks a lot about uh, working with various organisations and people uh, and of the 23 action points in it, um, 18 of them start with the line the Scottish Government will work with and, and I think that's very laudable uh, and I commend them for that but what I would like to see is more detail. What does will work with mean in a lot of these uh, aspects? Uh, it's a good document but it's not long enough. And I'm hoping perhaps in the closing statement the Minister might expand on some of the ways in which the government will work with specific organisations. I think the devil is very much in the detail here. And I also think that we should consider additional legislation. If an action plan doesn't suffice, or we, we as a parliament in a few years' time think we haven't made improvements, then what legislation could we look at? And, I, and I'm very open-minded to that. Uh, the internet is home to many new innovations. Uh, I'd like to draw our attention to one of them specifically, and that's uh, uh, dating apps on smartphones. Uh, they've become quite the norm, uh, but they often fail on age verification. Uh, it's very easy to bypass safeguards. Some have no safeguards at all. And when I talk about safeguards, I mean uh, the app simply asks for your date of birth. And that, to me, is not a safeguard. And likewise, it's all too easy to hide behind the anonymity of an internet profile. And unfortunately, there have been a handful of really tragic cases where things have gone quite horribly wrong. Uh, when I was living in London, uh, the gay community was really rocked by the needless deaths of four young men uh, who had met their uh, tragic fate at the hands of someone they met on a dating app. Uh, and that really brought it home to uh, me and my friends uh, how serious this, uh, this issue is. But we do have to be realistic. Young people are using the internet in the same way that adults are. And I think it's right that much of the focus is on child exploitation and the fact that adults are producing uh, disgusting, indecent images. But we should also have the conversation that many of these images are being created uh, by teenagers themselves and shared amongst each other. So we use the words like evil and wrong in the context of this parliament, but uh, in the context of, a, of an online world, uh, perhaps the creators of this content themselves do not associate words like evil or wrong with what they're doing. And I mention that for a very specific reason. I think that's, we have to think about that in terms of how we approach education. Uh, Ian Gray, I think, uh, mentioned this point, as did uh, Gillian Martin. Uh, if we go into this with a, a sense of um, 
uh, fear and shame on the subject matter. There's too much taboo when we talk about, about sex in general. Uh, not understanding why some of these images are being uh, uh, created by, the, 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 uh, by young people themselves. Uh, we should also mention uh, briefly uh, the fact that uh, some people have been targeted very specifically uh, uh, by, uh, by the sharing of some of these images. And in some cases, I've heard some tragic cases of people, uh, young people committing suicide as a result of the, the bullying and the threats being directed towards them. And I think that's because many of them have got to a stage where they don't know who to turn to. There's so much shame and stigma associated with telling someone that there's a problem. Uh, they don't want to tell someone that they actually took these types of photos in the first place. Therefore, find it difficult to seek help. You know, so we talk about Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and social media, but the worlds of Snapchat, Tumblr and Vine and even online gaming communities are the real environments where many 21st century teenagers live. And those are where many of the dangers lie. But that being said, one in eight five-year-olds has a Facebook account. And we all know that is completely in breach of the site's rules. But many parents allow it. So we must educate parents as well. But is it prohibition or persuasion? It's the age-old conundrum. Uh, there's no silver bullet uh, in legislating online content but it is worth noting that the House of Commons Home Affairs Select Committee uh, criticised internet giants for not doing enough. And the words they used were uh, completely irresponsible and indefensible. Now, some of them, to their credit, responded to that criticism by announcing investments in uh, new staff uh, to monitor online activity. Uh, one large social media, uh, media site uh, announced 3,000 more people. 3,000 more people. And that's on top of the 4,500 they already have. 7,500 people working for one company just monitoring activity online. That sounds great, but that same site has 1.9 billion users. And that's also a site where uh, recently someone broadcast live on their smartphone a murder. It sounds like something out of a horror movie, but it's happening. And it's happening on the same sites that we post pictures of kittens in our lunch on. So that's the reality of how technology has changed. I will conclude now. Uh, by saying that the online world is very hard to police because it is ever-changing. And with m many more of our children being online, I think this action plan is a really good start, and I, I do welcome it. Uh, but its implementation must be monitored closely. We cannot just pay lip service to the subject. We should be more frank about the discussion, and we should do everything we can as parliamentarians to support the government on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Ruth McGuire, last speaker in the open debate. Ms McGuire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate. Keeping children safe online is an important issue and something which should concern each and every one of us. We've all got a role to play. There's no doubt that the world of children and young people today is pretty radically different from the world in which most of us in this chamber grew up in. And I would share Ian Gray's reflection that perhaps we are overprotective in the outdoors in the real world and not protective enough online. So much of young people's time is spent online on multiple devices and forums for multiple reasons, often simultaneously, whether chatting to friends or family, doing homework, finding out what's going on, or just playing games and watching videos for fun. The online world and the offline world are the one thing to our young people. There are many positive or even just benign aspects to the spread of the internet, but as we've heard this afternoon, along with all the opportunities, there are also risks and dangers to young people. And I'd like to focus on a couple of these in my speech this afternoon. Um, bullying and the negative impact of the internet on young people's understanding of healthy relationships. As has been um, previously quite powerfully set out, cyberbullying allows bullying to take on a whole new dimension with many children and young people seemingly constantly attached to their phones, it can mean that they're not free from being attacked or, or persecuted. Um, there's, there's no safe space, even in their own home, they can be bullied, even in their own rooms. In addition to explicit bullying that takes place online, the dominance of the online sphere also creates new measurements of popularity and, and self-worth based on who has the most likes, the most followers, the most friends, who's in what group chat. 
For children and young people whose posts don't get liked um, while others do, this can lead to feelings of low self-worth. And others have also touched on some of the unrealistic um, images that young people see. Moving on to healthy and respectful relationships, the Education Committee on which I sit has recently, recently been considering personal and social education and sex and relationships education as a core issue within that. As part of the investigation work, the committee noted the increasing sexualisation of young people through their exposure to sexual images and formation, information through the media and popular culture. And that's before we even get to the easy availability of internet pornography. It really should be of huge concern to everyone that the internet, and including pornography, is such a significant source of information about sex for many of our young people. The NSPCC, giving evidence to the committee, quoted worrying research showing that by the age of 14, over 90% of young people had seen pornography and about half of the boys thought it was an accurate representation of sex. They also reported that girls were articulating that they were very worried about boys' impressions of and attitudes to women, and that these were negatively impacted by the exposure to this pornography. The dangers that this represents when it comes to things like consent, contraception, and, and basic re respect and treatment of others can hardly be overstated. As we're all aware, portrayals of women in the media and, of course, in pornography reinforce negative gender role stereotypes and seriously risk our young people developing unhealthy and negative expectations of sexual relationships. On the one hand, this issue can be approached in quite a straightforward manner by working closely with social media providers, mobile operators, internet providers to try and prevent access to harmful content for young people. On the other hand, overturning dangerously false perceptions of sex and relationships based on pornography is a lot more difficult. Good and fit for purpose personal and social education clearly has a role to play in combating the messages received online and ideally in preventing young people feeling that they need to go online to further their knowledge. I trust that the forthcoming report of the Education Committee can contribute towards that effort. But I have to say it's, it's all of our responsibility, it's society's responsibility, not just schools, to make sure that we're speaking to our children and young people um, about these issues and ensuring that they have positive and accurate information um, to help counter things they, they, they might stumble across online. And I think as well as talking to them, and these are sometimes difficult conversations, we also have to be good at listening and sometimes hearing things we don't want to hear. And I think. Uh, my colleague um, Gillian Martin's uh, speech illustrated that quite starkly. Entrenching an understanding of consent is crucial in all of this, and in general, just making sure that young people and children are aware of what healthy and respectful relationships look like. I know that Police Scotland have been doing great work across the country um, in terms of keeping young people safe online. And across North Ayrshire, officers are working with schools and other partners, including um, the Child Protection Committee, to report, promote responsible use of the internet and keep children safe. Earlier this week, in my own constituency, PC Young was speaking to the first co-winning guides about staying safe online. And we all know many other organisations working hard to protect our young people, from the Girl Guides to Respect Me, Bernardo's, NSPCC and the Commissioner for Children and Young People. And these organisations all have quite helpful information for parents about the topic. I welcome the Scottish Government's National Action Plan on Internet Safety for Children and Young People, and in particular the emphasis it places on working in partnership with organisations to ensure online safety. I look forward to continuing to do what I can in my role as an MSP, as well as as a mum, auntie, family member and friend to protect our young people and children online. Thank you very much. Move to closing speeches. I call Tabby Scott to close the Liberal Democrats. A generous six minutes, please, Mr Scott. Chair, Deputy Presiding Officer, now safe in the knowledge that there's no one in the media gallery and no one will be watching from the, uh, uh, in, on their tellies in the media offices, can I say how well everyone has spoken here uh, uh, today? Um, how many, uh, and Ruth McGuire just did it as well, um, excellent contribution, uh, very thoughtful. 
many uh, strong, strong points. And it just seems to me there have been three themes this afternoon that I very briefly want to uh, touch on in the, in the six minutes. And that's not a Stuart Stevenson six minutes, that's a Tavish Scott six minutes, I take it. Uh, 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 it's a Tavish Scott, which means seven minutes. <laughs> right. Gosh, everything's stretching these days. Um, uh, in the six minutes or seven that I, that I now don't have. Um, and the, and the, the three points are firstly, uh, and it's, it slightly goes to Ian Gray's philosophical, uh, always philosophical introduction to his remarks, uh, and that is about uh, relationship and sex education in schools, because what Ian Gray was rightly driving at, uh, and the Education Committee, of which a number of us, uh, Julian Martin and others, are on of late, have been looking into uh, how best and how are we making sure uh, that citizenship, that the challenges of being uh, a teenager, being a, a young person in 21st century Scotland, uh, are addressed through the support structures uh, that we have in place. And that, in, in, in a sense, is at the, core, at the heart of, of this debate. The, the balance between uh, privacy on one hand uh, and the need for knowledge about what is going on uh, on the other. The appropriate way in which we teach, encourage and help uh, relationship and sex education in schools. Who does it? And that is maybe my uh, one plea to the Minister um, uh, that, uh, again, as I, I entirely endorse uh, many colleagues across the Chamber who've said this is a good action plan, it does the right thing, it says uh, many of the right, uh, it, it, it drives at many of the right issues that do need to be addressed. Uh, but the key to any action plan, as I well remember from the past, uh, is who does it? Uh, and uh, my suggestion is that on PSE in schools uh, and on the importance of Ian uh, Gray's philosophical point, uh, it is that balance between teachers on one hand, on trained, able youth workers on the other, other. And yes, as many members have mentioned this afternoon, on parents too. And I am one of those as well. We have to accept as parents, and never mind anything else in life, uh, the, relationship, the, the challenges uh, of that role uh, because of online safety, because of the way in which we all use mobile phones, tablets and the rest, and more to the point because of how young people use that. Uh, people have made very sensible remarks about the dangers of sexting, of bullying, uh, of the mental health scars that now exist, the psychological pressures that exist for uh, young people. Uh, and uh, I just simply want to uh, reflect how accurate those are. Gillian Martin, uh, very powerful contribution. I could think of a highly comparable example from uh, my own part of the world while Gillian was describing uh, the, uh, the, the story that she did um, earlier in the uh, debate. Uh, and uh, that experience is uh, are, are arguably uh, some of the more arduous ones that we deal with as uh, elected representatives. What do you say uh, to a mum and dad who come to see you to constituency surgery who've been through something like that kind of uh, example other than to go and have a discussion with your local police, uh, uh, the youth work team uh, and others in, in, in seeking uh, the best way forward. And yes, the sc school is always where you uh, end up uh, back to, which is why, the, why I've made the point, and I apologise to Mark McDonald for labouring this uh, intensely, but why I've made the point about training and teacher training uh, for um, the next generation of uh, bright and able men and women we expect to look after our children uh, in the future. The second theme has been on criminal activity and again many colleagues have, have uh, drawn attention to the Internet Watch uh, Foundation uh, to minimise child sexual abuse content online and just to the range of work that many organisations, not least of which Police Scotland, uh, play and how important uh, that uh, is. Uh, one of the action points uh, that I do think the Government are absolutely right to uh, stress is the point that uh, Mark McDonald actually made in his opening remarks around the Digital Economy Act. Um, he will have to refresh the chamber. I think I do believe it did become an act in a wash-up before the before Westminster. Uh, I was about to say collapsed for the election. That's maybe a little unfair. Um, finished for the uh, for the election. Uh, but the point that um, the minister made, which I, did, I do think, and others made as well, which I do think is uh, particularly important, is ensuring the industry sees the protection of children as one of their core responsibility. And we'll take the industry uh, absolutely in the in the round. Uh, on that. Uh, and that's the point I um, did think about when Stuart Stephen was giving us a, a somewhat of a tour de force of Europe. It was actually the point about India, um, because um, Stuart Stevenson's example on India was that 1.1 billion, and he'll correct me if I get the numbers wrong, but 1.1 billion people are now um, enshrined in a program which is about giving them, as it were, a digital identity. Now that goes at the heart of Ian Gray's point, which is where is that balance between individual rights and privacy, and on the other hand, the state uh, having a role in your uh, in your future because it is because it has an individual uh, an individual ability to assess where you are Stuart Stevenson uh, just, 
just for clarity, I think I said it, the Indian system is voluntary. The state is not mandating that you must be there. But I think its success is seen that almost everybody seems to have signed up. I, and I entirely take that, uh, entirely, uh, take that point. The, the third um, aspect uh, of this debate, and therefore of uh, any government's responsibility in this area, is uh, what does this vast growth in digital use, in online use, mean for reading and writing? Uh, the core responsibilities of our education uh, system. Now, again, uh, I, I find the evidence, well, there isn't much evidence in this area, but I did find one, um, uh, one academic that I did want to share with the uh, chamber to finish up with this afternoon, and that is uh, Passe Salberg from Finland, uh, who has looked into is um, information technology, is, is online content damaging literacy, given again that we're that putting aside the political debate about literacy at the moment, we're putting everyone is putting a huge amount of pressure uh, on for uh, improvement in that area. And um, Salzburg's findings uh, are that according to some national statistics, most teenagers in Finland spend more than four hours a day on the internet. Uh, that the number of heavy internet and other media users in, is increasing in that country as it is doing in the USA, Canada and beyond. And according to the emerging research on how the internet affects the brain and therefore learning, suggests there are three principal consequences, shallower information processing, increased distractibility and altered self-control mechanisms. And if that is true, if, if that is true, presiding officer, then there, this is reason to believe there, that increasing use of digital technologies for communication, interaction and entertainment will make concentration on complex conceptual issues like those in maths and science more difficult. Now, I, only, I don't know if that's true or not, but what I do know is that's the kind of judgment that um, research needs to look into most closely. Because this, as this role worlds out, and Annie Wells was quite right, she said it's, uh, I think she used a sea of opportunity, I thought she was talking about the common fisheries policy there, but, but uh, uh, as she, I think she said, the, 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 <laughs> indeed, I, as she uh, said, the internet is a sea of opportunity, we can mix lots of metaphors here, but uh, a sea of opportunity. Um, so it is a sea of danger as, as well. And that is the literacy danger, if it is one. And all I ask the government is to bear that in mind. And if ever there's a need to commission some research, it's into exactly that issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Daniel Johnson. And you too have a Tavish Scott six minutes, if we remember what oh, that thank was. You. Well, any comparisons with Tavish Scott are, of course, are of course welcome. Uh, but this is a... This is a, a this is a, a, a very important debate. It's a very important issue, one that any of us who are parents will recognise as being a huge concern, and one which is, of course, I think a concern for the whole of society. So, at the risk of using perhaps unparliamentary language, can I just say, I think it can really suck being a teenager. The concern whether or not you're friends with the right people, concerns whether or not you're being invited to the right things, concerns about what people are saying behind your back, it's almost as bad as being a parliamentarian. And the, the reality is, is that we all know those pressures of being a teenager. We've all lived them. And the reality is, I think, for many of us of our age, is that we are thankful that we didn't go through that while the internet was around, that we didn't have those additional pressures amplifying those effects. And can I also just call on everyone to condemn Kate Forbes for reminding us all how much more recently those memories are for her than the rest of us. And thanks, Stuart Stevenson, for putting that context back the other direction. <laughs> but it is a serious issue. Um, and whether or not we look at the, the more broad uh, impacts that these things may have around adolescent mental health issues, and I think Tavish Scott raised those very well, um, or through to the much more serious cases, such as those of Breck Bednar, who... Uh, that he was a 14-year-old uh, boy using uh, uh, an online gaming platform and was introduced to another slightly older boy who subsequently groomed him and then murdered him. Um, these, that's the, the most, most serious end of the spectrum. And I think other members have done an excellent job of highlighting the issues and concerns. And again, can I just add my note of thanks to Gillian Martin for doing such an excellent job of highlighting some of the, the contemporary issues that, that people face at school around sexting and the use of social media. So the task that we have for us is to look at the role of technology, how we can adapt it. And I think the Minister has been absolutely right to acknowledge its pervasive uh, nature, and that it is not separate in the eyes of many people who are using it. But it does have advantages and possibilities. The ability to learn and acquire knowledge is huge, and we cannot ignore that. So this is about uh, embracing digital citizenship. Um, 
So I would thank the Scottish Government for bringing forward this action plan. It is useful. As Ian Gray said, this is a subject area which can be difficult to understand. It can therefore be difficult for us to know what we can uh, do and certainly difficult to reach out to everyone that needs to be reached. So this plan enshrining the, the fact that we must ensure that children have the understanding of the opportunities and risks, that looks to uh, equip parents and carers, that has that holistic wider society view and that seeks to uh, support children who have suffered and most importantly to deter perpetrators, those have to be the right things to look at. That is a, a very important start. This is a serious area but it is also fast moving. And so I think it is right that members across this chamber have also pointed out areas where perhaps this uh, uh, framework can be improved and uh, enhanced. And, and it's in that uh, tone and tenor that I would like to make the rest of my comments. So I would like to join with, with others, pointing out that I think that the government could go further in terms of specifying who should be taking these actions and also what those actions should be. I think Jamie Green put it very well in his comments. And in my research uh, on this topic, I was uh, taken to a recent well, uh, OECD report on the protection of children online. And I think it made a number of very important points around the way that policy should be made and implemented. So it highlights the importance of policy coordination, consistency and coherence. And also that the evidence must uh, be at the very heart of this, both in terms of measures and evaluation. Because this is an moving piece. So unless that evaluation and those measures are at the very heart of the policy approach, it will never keep pace. So with this in mind, um, I think that this is a good start, that it does have much of that coherence and consistency that the OEC point out is important. But as to point 12, which asks whether or not there could be more co coordination, I would suggest that there must be more coordination. Indeed, I think um, around evaluation, there must be more of that embedded so while it's raised in point seven, I think we'd like to see the government go further. And I think Annie Wells's amendment around the need for measurement and establishing our progress is really very important. But I'd also just like to highlight Claire Baker's point about the need for a, a wider, more encompassing strategy. For one of the things that the OECD report does was produce a taxonomy, which is, I think was a very useful framework for understanding the broad range of risks and aspects that we need to protect um, our, our children from and equip them from. So in particular, while this debate has focused about cyberbullying, online grooming, the framework the OECD produced also looks at consumer-related risks and information privacy and security risks. So on the consumer-related risk point, that's such things as children's access to gambling and their ability to buy alcohol. Now these seem, might seem mundane, but they're nonetheless important risks that I think that we need to look at and make sure that the, 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 the action plan encompasses. And likewise, information privacy and security, we must make sure that we're preparing our young people to be responsible and well-equipped digital citizens, rather than wholly focusing on protecting against the bigger risks, the more obvious risks that, that we see um, and have been hearing about today. But let me also touch upon Tavish Scott's amendment, because I think it raises very important points indeed. As many other members have been pointing out in the chamber this afternoon, the Education Committee has been looking at teacher training. And I have to say that that meeting was one that raised a lot of concerns and alarms. Not least, I think that there is a, a concerns around the expectations that we have on teacher training and the reality of what's really being delivered. The focus and time and attention that's being given to very important points like literacy and numeracy. But perhaps in terms of this debate, the most alarming thing that one teacher was saying that they were given no ICT content whatsoever. And I asked for a clarification, a qualification of that. Was she meaning just within the specifics of cyberbullying? And she said, no, none at all. And I think that is deeply alarming. So while I welcome the minister's commitment to look at the, uh, uh, the role of teacher training, the prepare, preparation of our teachers, I would, I think that we have to look very carefully at teacher training in the round that I think that it's, it's uh, of huge concern that an important topic such as ICT is not being covered at all because the technology is pervasive, it is everywhere. So therefore, they need to be using teacher in terms of the delivery of their teaching, the medium for learning, expression of our children, and technology as a subject. But above all else, within this uh, uh, subject, it's vital that teachers do have that time, that focus on protecting children, uh, uh, training them to be responsible digital citizens. So I would hope that the, the minister takes that away and that's looked at with great care 
and sensitivity. But above all else, what we must do is have a plan that enables everyone to work together, that we take our responsibility collectively, that we have a coherent plan. I think this is an excellent start. And while I have made a number of criticisms, they are genuinely being made in the most positive light. Um, so I thank the Minister and I, I welcome the amendments that we will be supporting today. Thank, thank you, you, Mr Johnson. I call Brian Whittle to close the Conservatives. Nine minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I can I first refer members to my declarations of interest in that I am a director and chairholder of two online communication and collaboration platforms. Uh, I don't receive any remuneration for these posts. And I'm also a board member uh, for the West of Scotland NSPCC. And I am pleased to have the opportunity to close this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. And can I thank Mark Macdonald and the Scottish Government for bringing this important debate to the Chamber. And it's been a very consensual debate with a variety of really thoughtful speeches. Kate Forbes uh, telling us of her journey uh, through her technology, uh, and I compared it with mine, and can I let Kate Forbes know she has made a happy man very old. And I also enjoyed very much uh, Stuart Stevenson's uh, contribution to this debate and in his own informed and inimitable way in words and erotic movements, some of which I actually understood. And but what, what the debate really highlighted for me is the dilemma uh, that we have as parents in allowing access uh, to the internet for our, our, our youngsters. And that was brought to starkly to light by uh, Gillian Martin's testimony, along with Colin Beattie and Jeremy Balfour. And of course, Tavish Scott, uh, I have to thank him for, for uh, uh, bringing Stuart Stevenson's great uncle Socrates uh, to the chamber uh, and with the expected quality I do expect from him. But what he did was highlight the learning capacity that we have in new technology. And the internet can be a wonderful learning tool. Uh, for example, like, like many parents do, I was reading a, a bedtime book to my youngest uh, last weekend uh, about the, the, the South Seas and about diving for, diving for treasure when, when, when the book started to talk about sunfish and moonfish. Now, my daughter asked me rather skeptically if these were real things. And 30 seconds later, via an iPad, we were in the South Seas watching videos of sunfish and moonfish. What an incredible way of really bringing words to life. If I had tried to describe these rather strange looking creatures, she would immediately have thought, dad's at it again. <coughs> so there you go, the internet as a tool to prove that dad wasn't at it. But be warned because of course, the converse is true. Our children are better online than we are and they can quite as easily show us up when we try to pull the wool over their eyes. But what's really interesting to me about mobile, the mobile technology of the internet is, is it's, now, it's now encouraging outdoor learning and activity. And I know that the Chamber know that I talk about this a lot. Uh, and, and through gaming, gamification uh, of, 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 sort of activity outdoors, the kids are now taking their mobile technology outdoors. And what a fantastic way to learn. But as Ian Gray highlighted, it's, it's our struggle to qualify the risk of our children being online in our homes and outside. Where as a parent I get nervous is when the iPad becomes a tool for communicating between friends or even with unknowns, perhaps even in interactive online gaming. We think of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and Messenger and WhatsApp and Viber and Skype, YouTube as some of the main communication platforms. Of course, there are many, many more platforms and apps available, easily downloadable, that allow unfettered video, picture and text communication. And this is a dilemma that has been discussed across this chamber. As Mark MacDonald has asked, how do we ensure that our children get access to this wonderful educational tool while protecting them from the worst in online behaviours? It's an issue I actually have faced when we were building a sports, social media and IPTV platform several years ago. How do you allow subscribers to freely share training videos, live stream events, share pictures and conversations while ensuring that the platform is not used in an abusive manner. Now, there are off-the-shelf software solutions that are actually very, quite, are quite sophisticated. They can actually identify skin tone to such a level as they'll know if the person is wearing a pair of shorts or not, and remotely decide whether that image is appropriate for uploading. There are some simple software solutions that can prevent bad language and any the derivatives of bad language being used and uploaded. But the truth of the matter is, for any fledgling or small company, the expense can be extremely prohibitive. Now, this is not such an, an issue for those platforms where a stringent gateway to access <coughs> is the paramount selling point for such as legal, medical or accountancy portals. 
and they can afford to make access to their platforms a more demanding process because of their users' re uh, requirement of high levels of security as their primary concern. So there is a balance to be made for platforms and apps between safety protocols and simplicity of access of use. The more safety and security protocols put in place, the more likely this impacts on the ease of usability. There is undoubtedly a reluctance in some of the major mainstream social media players to enhance safety and security for fear of driving off their users to their other, to their other competitors, as I think Stuart Stevenson uh, highlighted. This inevit inevitably leads to reliance on self, a level of self-policing on platforms where users are expected to report behaviour not in keeping with the platform's rules and regulations. And there are hugely different levels of protocols and successes. We have reports of abusive content being reported but not being removed from, for some considerable time, as, as Jamie Green alluded to in one of his earlier interventions. Unfortunately, there's just little to protect the most vulnerable. To protect this user profile, the education of parents, as Tavish Scott has said, and carers is still going to be the most effective strategy. Ensuring that when children and young people have access to and are using mobile and other internet devices, parents and carers are aware of the dangers and understand how to enable parental locks and safety features, as, as, as Monica Lennon has said. And to that end, there are some excellent awareness raising initiatives currently operating, which need more publicity and more encouragement to adopt. I think Ruth McGuire and Monica Lennigan spoke about the children knowing uh, what a healthy relationship looks like. And I have to say, the NSPCC uh, are, are currently running a, a programme in our, our primary schools uh, around recognition of, of abuse, because the reality is, in, in children's cases, uh, and often in, in their cases, they are being abused and don't realise it. And what I have to say is, is I, I, as, uh, as a member of the, the NSPCC board, I was rather uh, concerned about uh, and reluctant to, to, to think about how do you teach that kind of level of sexual abuse and sex education to primary school children. So I went and sat at the back of the class, uh, at one of the classes, to listen to what it is they actually do. And it's absolutely fantastic how they do it. I, I came out of there really quite buoyed. And, um, I, I, my, my own uh, eight-year-old daughter, soon to be nine, uh, re that this year has come back to me, having gone through that programme. Not know, I didn't know she was going through that programme. And in the, the car on the way home, started talking to me, do you know what, do you know what uh, sexual abuse is, Dad? And I have to say, you know, as a, fa a father uh, to three daughters, having been through that whole process, it was actually quite enlightening to hear that uh, my nine-year-old has already, uh, already started to talk quite openly about that. And I think these are the kind of things that we really need to, to highlight and, and advance. However, it is incumbent upon this parliament to make our voice and views known to bodies such as the UK Council for Child Internet Safety Technical Working Group, specifically around technical and regulatory standards, as well as classification and rating of content. We also have a role to play in encouraging the continual driving of innovation in the area of protective tools and services, because quite frankly, currently I feel they were always playing catch up. Deputy Presiding Officer, when considering and developing online safety and security for the most vulnerable, especially around social media and communication type tools, we are all aware, as, as Annie Wells has said, and Morris Corey and, and others have said, we are all aware of the dangers of cyberbullying of accessing inappropriate content, of having online identities hacked and stolen, and much more sinister behaviour towards child internet users. It is therefore an ongoing fight to ensure that technology in safety and security around child online safety is given the attention it needs and keeps pace with the development of software platform technology. This is why this debate is so important, to keep this topic at the forefront of our minds and to remind us to keep the pressure on online developers and bodies who regulate content, standards and protocols for access so that child safety and security is paramount. And that support for the government's national plan on internet safety for children and young people will help to maintain that vigilance in our drive to ensure that online, uh, being online is a positive experience for our children. Let's keep talking and let's keep taking and demanding appropriate action. I am happy to have spoken in this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I just say from the chair, I, I echo Tavish Scott's comments there, what an interesting and informed debate this has been, what listening from the chair. It doesn't mean to say you're not going to be an interesting minister. I call Mark MacDonald to wind up the government. <laughs> that was a hostage to fortune. Uh, till 4.59, please, uh, minister.
Well, I noticed you got the compliments in before I had spoken, presiding officer. Um, I do hope, however, that Tavish Scott has paid attention to the fact that, as I know he does, that this is me yet again bringing another debate to the chamber, which is going to unite us all uh, in commonality of purpose. Uh, I'm sure he will be keeping note of that, although I apologise for the fact that uh, in this debate I wasn't able to facilitate him getting away for the early flight to Sumbra, uh, as I did previously. Um, but he mentioned uh, in his closing remarks uh, Passy Salberg, who uh, obviously is one of the International Council of Education Advisors to the Scottish Government, and he will have heard uh, the Deputy First Minister uh, citing the uh, body of evidence to which he referred. Um, and we do recognise that there is uh, a, a lack of evidence out there, but what evidence there is does point to the need to ensure that uh, internet use is uh, balanced uh, in terms of how it is, how it is used uh, within education, but also uh, within the home environment uh, as well. But I'm sure there, there are other uh, studies being commissioned out there which the government will pay uh, close attention to. Um, Brian Whittle uh, spoke about um, the uh, issue around self-policing uh, and also about keeping pace of change and that's something that's come up a lot during the debate. I think one of the challenges that is faced by uh, a number of organisations and uh, companies out there is that the creation of some apps is becoming an easier thing for those with the skills to do. So you don't require to have a significant uh, backroom operation in order to launch uh, a, a networking app. That runs then the risk uh, of large uptake uh, not being able to be supported by that organisation. So we have to ensure um, that where these apps are out there, um, we have to ensure that the individuals uh, or organisations who are launching them are aware, uh, and as I re referred earlier, that protection of children and young people has to form part of the core responsibility that they see uh, as a business. Uh, I think it has been a very constructive and consensual debate, and there are a number of points that I want to try and get through uh, in the time that I have. Uh, remaining. Um, Annie Wells um, asked me to consider um, looking at timescales uh, in relation to the action plan and I'm afraid I have to advise the Chamber that one of the timescales mentioned within the action plan uh, has already slipped. Uh, because if we look at point number 22 uh, around the um, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Sur Service Summit, uh, that will now no longer be taking place in June 2017, it will be in September 2017. However, the reason for that is because we've had to change the date as a result of the snap general election, so I'm more than happy to blame the Tories uh, for that, uh, that target being missed uh, in relation to that. But I think uh, members would recognise that we want to ensure that uh, we can have the appropriate individuals uh, involved uh, in that summit. Um, in terms of the uh, overall uh, timescale in relation to the work, I am happy to reflect on where we can uh, pin defined timescales on some of this, because some of this work will be iterative uh, and ongoing. Um, I also uh, would point out that we are uh, looking to develop, uh, I think she spoke about developing guidance for professionals and parents. Uh, that's part of what the developing uh, guidance on digital citizenship uh, will specifically be looking at, including information on respectful behaviours, rights and responsibilities, resilience, uh, and where to go to uh, for support. Uh, and we'll also consider issues uh, raised by issues uh, around self-produced sexual images or sexting. Uh, I want to highlight two contributions in particular, if members will forgive me. The first of those is the uh, contribution that my uh, friend and colleague Gillian Martin brought to the Chamber, which I thought was an absolutely uh, essential and powerful uh, crystallisation of the issues uh, that are being faced by young people through the prism uh, of uh, a case in her own constituency, but also uh, highlighted the positive work that she's doing locally with uh, her incoming members of the Scottish Youth Parliament to try and hear young people's voices and see what actions can be taken off the back of those. If I can say to Gillian Martin, I would be very interested to hear more uh, about the work that is being done and be more than happy to meet with her and her MSYPs uh, in the aftermath of that event to find out what they've learned and how we as a government can perhaps uh, work alongside them with some of the issues that they've identified. Uh, in terms uh, of the other contribution I want to highlight, I want to highlight um, the contribution uh, of Kate Forbes, not because it made everybody in the chamber, including myself, feel really old, um, but because she highlighted a very important point and that was around the way in which uh, the imagery that is projected through social media 
creates a, a false image of the perfection of individuals' lives, of the images that young people uh, have of themselves. Um, many people who uh, are friends with me on Facebook would be forgiven for thinking that my house is very tidy because of the way in which I strategically position any photographs that are taken within the building. Um, but I, I was interested by the notion of the filtering of photos. My wife says there is no Instagram filter that can improve my image. I've chosen to take that in the positive sense uh, of the terminology. <laughs> Uh, nonetheless. Um, but mem th there were a number of other points which I think uh, bear, bear repeating. The, the issue around resilience of young people I think came through uh, quite a lot in ensuring that young people are made aware uh, of the risks that they potentially face. And I take on board the points that have been made and why I've accepted the Liberal Democrat Amendment is we need to look at how they can receive that information in terms of uh, education. And not just, I think, education in terms uh, of the uh, risks that exist online, um, because I think that that is uh, undoubtedly uh, something we need to look at, but the point was made by a number of times, I think it was Ian Gray who first raised it, around ensuring that young people have a better understanding of the nature of consent and the nature of what is appropriate in terms of the kind of uh, things, the information, the images that they should be sharing, whether that is with somebody who they uh, have never met or whether it is with somebody who they know and who they potentially know well. And Gillian Martin made that point very clearly when she spoke of the individual uh, who uh, was mentioned to her uh, holds images of her friends which she can then potentially use uh, in order to uh, bully or blackmail them uh, in future. I think that was a very worrying development but it's something that we need to ensure young people are aware of what is appropriate to share even within what they assume to be uh, their circle uh, of friends. Um, in terms of the uh, contribution that uh, Stuart, Stevenson, Stuart Stevenson brought to us, um, which I thought highlighted a number of very interesting international examples, uh, I would say I think they, they may stretch beyond the, the mere uh, children and young people's safety, but I think they do touch uh, on wider issues uh, of internet safety and internet resilience. Um, but he spoke uh, about the need to ensure that as well as looking at how we protect children from physical harm, we're also cognizant uh, of the psychological harm, and that is something which uh, internet safety uh, should very much uh, be focused on. Uh, Monica Lennon then followed up by saying that she was going to set her daughter a task uh, to research uh, Stuart Stevenson's family tree, I think it was. Those of us who've been in this chamber long enough and heard enough of Mr. Stevenson's speeches would suggest it's probably more of a forest than a tree. But uh, nonetheless, uh, I wish her daughter uh, luck uh, in relation to that. But I think Monica Lennon also highlighted the point that you know, we need to ensure that uh, young people are cognizant of risk, but also resilient to be able to deal with it. And I think uh, the number of us in this debate who've spoken as parents, from our perspective, recognize that we've got a role to play in this as well, in making sure that we uh, are as understanding uh, and as up to speed as we possibly can be in terms of the, uh, the, the way in which the internet affects our children's lives uh, and the way in which our children uh, are interacting on the internet. There are a number of apps out there uh, which uh, provide uh, what, what we would term children-friendly versions of more regular social media uh, applications. Uh, and they are uh, to be commended, those organisations, for creating those filters. But we saw recently through a BBC report that not all of these are entirely safe from being infiltrated by inappropriate content. So even in those uh, what we assume to be safe spaces online, we still have to be aware that many children and young people do face potential risks and we have to have an understanding uh, of how we can tackle those, how we can deal with those and how we can prevent uh, against those. Um, in, in terms of, uh, I was very interested by Jamie Green's contribution because he started off by telling us uh, about his ownership of a number of internet domains and that piqued my natural curiosity. So I went uh, and checked uh, what these are. And it turns out that Jamie Green uh, owns a number of uh, internet domains with the domain .london. And that says to me that what Mr. Green is waiting for is waiting for an enterprising mayor in the future to say that he's going to launch the dot London uh, in the same way that we've launched dot Scott. And at that point in time, Jamie Green is going to be launched into the stratosphere in terms of being an internet multimillionaire. And at that point, I want him to remember that I spotted this uh, in, in this debate in this chamber when that day eventually comes, as it no doubt shall. But he asked me to expand in a more serious uh, context. He asked me to expand uh, on the point uh, about what kind of action are we going to take and who are we going to be working with in terms of some of the actions that we're taking forward. So in terms of uh, parents, carers and families, we'll be working with 
parent and carer organisations to bring together the uh, different, or, uh, different uh, summits that we want to attract parents and carers to because as was pointed out by Ian Gray we need to ensure that as many parents and carers as possible take advantage of the opportunity to learn more about their children's internet use uh, and how they can support it. Um, will remain engaged with the UK Government uh, as they develop a new internet safety strategy which is looking at tackling uh, online dangers facing children and young people uh, uh, and also look at the uh, implementation of the age veri verification provisions within the Digital Economy Act and Tavish Scott was right uh, that it has become an act in the rec very recent past. There's that pace of change thing uh, getting beyond where we are in terms of the plan that was launched in April. But that, again, is an example of some of the work that we'll be doing. Uh, we'll be piloting the Click Path to Protection training module in Scotland with the Marie Collins Foundation, uh, targeted at professionals charged with safeguarding children who've been sexually abused and exploited online. We'll be engaging with the University of Edinburgh and Stop It Now Scotland as they undertake research on deterrence to viewing online indecent images of children. Uh, Police Scotland are developing a standard operating procedure for online abuse, uh, which will develop and enhance the existing uh, indecent images of children standard operating procedure. So that's a range of the different actions we'll be taking and some, not all, but some of the different partners who will be working with to take those actions forward. I think Mr Green wanted off an intervention. Happened. Very briefly, we're near the end. Jamie Green. Very brief. Um, on that specific point, the uh, Stop It Now Scotland uh, project, which I believe the government is uh, backing or investing in, uh, is it, somewhat controversial in the sense that perpetrators go to that service and all information shared with it is passed to authorities, whereas in Germany they've trialled other services where it's a completely confidential service. Does the Minister have any views on what's the best model? Don't, don't, I don't have specific views on what the best model is, but I think what we want to do is to work to ensure uh, that what we are doing is cutting down on the opportunities for online abuse and where that abuse is taking place, we're preventing it, we're preventing it as quickly uh, as we possibly can. I just want to finish, Presiding Officer, by highlighting a point that my uh, colleague Ruth Maguire uh, made. She praised the work that Police Scotland has been undertaking uh, in terms of their Choices for Life uh, peer mentoring programme. Um, I had the opportunity uh, to see firsthand that work being done at Hamden Park and to speak to some of the young people who were taking part in that. We have to recognise, and again, Gillian Martin pointed this out and it was pointed out by a number of other members, that children are not always at risk simply from uh, adults uh, online. Sometimes they are at risk from their peer groups as well. Part of that will be about the points that Ian Gray raised about getting children to better understand how to respect one another and respect specific boundaries. But part of it also is about peer-to-peer -peer education so that young people understand both how they can protect against behaviours in, these manner, in, in, the, in this manner, but also uh, be prevented from undertaking those behaviours in the first place. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on keeping children safe online. The next item of business is consideration of motion 5456 in the name of Claire Adamson on the Lobbying Scotland Act 2016 Standing Order Rule Changes. I call on Claire Adamson to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Committee has proposed new procedures in standing orders. The Lobbying Scotland Act 2016 establishes a registration regime for lobbyists, including an online register, which will be introduced and administered by the Scottish Parliament. It is anticipated that the formal commencement date for the Act will be in early 2000, 2018. The Lobbying Act gives certain delegated powers to the Parliament. The Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee has considered carefully what new procedures are required in standing orders to allow the Parliament to give directions and make resolutions under the Lobbying Act. A new Chapter 3C is proposed which contains the necessary rules and I'm pleased to move this motion in my name. Thank you very much and the question on the motion will be put at decision time and there are four questions today at decision time. The first question is that amendment 5515.2 in the name of Annie Wells which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Mark Macdonald on keeping children safe online be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that is that Amendment 5515.1 in the name of Tavish Scott, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Mark Macdonald, be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And the next question is that motion 5515 in the name of Mark Macdonald, as amended, on keeping children safe online, be agreed? Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The final question is that motion 5456 in the name of Claire Adamson 
on behalf of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee on the Lobbying Scotland Act 2016 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.